a service of KIVMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Me, sweetheart. Was it awful, Sam? Excruciating. If I suffered, girl, how I suffered. But there's no other way, Sam. Hmm? When fate turns against a man... True, dear one, true. But from somewhere I must find strength. You must. You must. To pick up the shattered fragments of my life. To raise my eyes once again to the horizon and piece by piece put them together again. Sam! And the two of us, dear one, hand in hand, shall go marching down the years together. Oh, yeah. Brace yourself, sweetheart. I'll try, Sam. Gather together the homely, humble tools of your trade. Find six dry handkerchiefs and prepare to greet me with a smile behind the tear. I'll be down before you can change stations with a report entitled, The Soap Opera Caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in... The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam? Who called, young Witter Perrine? Plain F. Is it all over, Sam? Uh, is a soap opera ever over, dear one? Oh, but it's not on the phone like you I know, I know, but it's not the end. It's never the end. Pull up a chair now. Take a firm grip on pad, pencil, and your emotions. Got them? I'm at the ready, Sam. Good show. To Agatha Pillbeam, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the soap opera caper. How was I to know what was on her mind? This strange woman, this mysterious Agatha Pilbeam, this voice on the telephone, directing me to the big, sprawling house in Hillsboro. Is that clear, Mr. Spade? How urgent is it, Miss Pilbeam? Very, very urgent, Mr. Spade. I, I don't know which way to turn. So I went to the big, sprawling house in Hillsboro, pulled up behind an ancient Model A parked at the curb, and was walking past it toward the gate when... Spade! Huh? Oh, oh, Croc Morton, isn't it? <laughs> Good old Sammy, you remember. Yeah, yeah. When'd you get out? I, I, oh, last month. But mm -hmm. I'm a good boy now. Here, take one of my cards. Yeah, if you know anyone who needs a first-class private eye, Croc's available. Uh, what are you doing here, Sam? The lady wants to see me. The soap opera queen? Is that what she is? Sure, six or eight of them, she writes. Oh? Hmm? Uh, behind the clouds, mm -hmm. the heart of Julia Jukes. That must be. Life, uh... No, oh, I forget the rest. Yeah. Beach gum shoe and Sammy. Yeah, well, right if you get work, Croc. Yeah, I'm on a job right now. I mean, you got your license already? Oh, me? Well, I... Well, you can always run off a photo stat of someone else's. Oh, oh Sam, that's mean. Croc was a crook, but a nice crook. He never killed anybody. He was just an uncurable camera fiend, specializing in taking pictures of people doing what they hadn't ought to be doing, you know, stuff like that. Or if you wanted a photo stand of somebody else's document, Croc was your man. Well, I walked up the drive to the door, threw it past a white shirt front that turned out to have a butler in it, and toward what seemed to be your study. But it wasn't. It was your bedroom, and you were reclining on six pillows with a cigarette in a long holder in one hand and a mouthpiece of a dictating machine in the other. But, John... Hush, Melinda. There is no way to go now but ahead. John, you're so strong. I need you. I need your courage. We must face this thing together, Melinda. The organ what was Veronica a phonograph playing in her ear. There is indeed. I waited for an opening, but there like... just wasn't any, don't so I had to interrupt. John, don't even... Uh, Miss uh, don't Pilbeam... Don't Melinda. We if, can't run if, away from life. Uh, Miss... We must approach this... Miss Pilbeam? Calmly, uh, Melinda. Uh, uh, beg your pardon? Oh, uh, just a minute. Oh. My mood music. I see. Uh, I'm Sam Spade, Miss Pilbeam. Well, come. Come sit beside me, Mr. Spade. Well... It's time we talked things over. Well, Thanks. Oh, maybe you'd better start at the... When a woman reaches 40, Mr. Spade, she comes to lean upon her man. Oh? To look upon him not just as someone to cherish, but as a source, a spring, a fountain of strength. 
Hmm? Are you still dictating? I'm talking about me, Mr. Spade. Oh. Whom can I turn to? Whom? I grope, I flounder in the darkness, I cry out, I listen in vain for an answer. But there is none. Well, you always have a better chance of getting an answer when you ask a question. What do you mean? What are we talking about? What indeed? Well, I haven't caught the show lately. You'll uh, have to bring me up to date. Why don't you run through the announcer's part, will you? You know, right after the organ when he says, uh, When we left Julia Jukes yesterday... I'm sorry, I thought I told you on the telephone. No. For many days now, I've seen somewhat of a strange new look on my husband's face. Husband? Dr. Martin Hawkes. Oh, you married. I thought it was Miss Agatha Pilby. Oh, two years ago today, I met young Dr. Hawkes and married him. Good. Life became beautiful, a gay laughing thing, a road to happiness. And then... Then? A cloud passed over the sun. Martin became moody, silent. I tried to penetrate the shell, but he only drew farther into it. A strange, terrifying crevasse seemed to have opened up between us. Well... What is it, Martin? I asked him repeatedly. But he'd only stare silently out the window. And finally walked... Silently from the room. Well, uh, how long did this go on? How, how long a series did you get out of it? For weeks until a few days ago when the final blow fell. Mm. It was evening, and Agatha and Martin were at dinner. Let's look in on them as... Oh, sorry. Mm. Uh, we were at dinner when the doorbell rang, and I answered it. It was a telegram for Martin mm. from Mexico. I gave it to him and watched the blood drain from his handsome features as he read it. His hand trembled, his jaw clenched. But you forced yourself to speak. Yes. Uh. What is it, Martin, I asked. Tell me, please, for the sake of our love. And he... Looked down at me as if I were a stranger. Wow. Then he crumpled the telegram, threw it savagely into the fireplace, and strode silently from the room. Here. Here, I rescued it from the flames. Read it. Thank you. Uh, regret must confirm your worst fears, Cardoza. What is the terrible secret of Martin Hawkes? Yes. Why did he act so strangely when the mysterious telegram arrived from Mexico? And above all, where is he? You mean he didn't come back? He's been gone for four days, Mr. Spade. I must find him. Now, of all times, I need his love. Exactly. When a woman reaches 40... I know, I know. What do you mean, now, of all times? It's been just a week now since the report came back from the laboratory after my physical examination. Oh. The doctor from Vienna. Mm -hmm. You see, Mr. Spade, I, too, have a terrible secret. Well, uh, don't you want to tell me about it? Yes. I have a very rare, incurable disease. There are only... only six short weeks to live. Less than an hour after his distressing interview with Agatha, our boy Sammy walked into the beautifully appointed office of young Dr. Hawks at 450 Sutter to find his nurse, pretty young Nora Sheldrake, a new character, working at her desk in the reception room. In response to a question from Sammy, we hear Nora saying, I have no idea where Martin has gone, Mr. Spade, but I can tell you why. Tell me, Nora. Please feel free to tell me everything. It, it's that... That woman, Mr. Spade. Agatha? Yes. Yes, Agatha. Mm -hmm. She never understood Martin. She doesn't understand Martin. She never has tried to understand Martin. Do you hear me? You she never has tried. I, I take it you don't care for Agatha Pilby. I hate her. Nora. I do. I hate her. She thinks her money can buy everything. Even Martin. Well, it won't. She knows that now. Well, calm yourself, Nora. Try and think back now to the last time you saw Martin Hawks. It was Monday. Four days ago? Yes. The call came from some legal firm named Bennett and Hatch. Now, let me write that down. I switched the call into Martin. I was worried for him. I was concerned. I have to admit now I did a terrible thing. Ah, you listened in. I did. They told him his sister was in town, that she was working at some... at some nightclub... He wanted to see him. Uh, what nightclub was this? Let me see. It was the... The Tortuga. Mm -hmm. What else? That's all. They hung up then. And Martin came out. 
I watched the blood drain from his handsome features. His hand trembled, his jaw clenched. Yes. I'm going out, Nora, he said. If I'm not back, don't worry. That's all. It was so like Martin. The Tortuga was only a few blocks away on Post Street, so I walked there. We were just tooling up with the dinner trade when I arrived. I sailed around backstage like Billy Rose on an inspection tour. Found the doorman and showed him the snapshot you'd given me of young Dr. Hawks. Or tried to. Look, young fella, I told you we don't have no dancer here named Hawks. I ain't got time to... Doorman, doorman, please, oh, uh, take a look at the picture. No, I ain't got your... What, picture. Yeah. 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 Hmm? That fellow was here at that. Tuesday, uh, the, uh, Monday night it was. Well, who'd he come to see? Well, it wasn't nobody named Hawks, mister. It was Beth Jardine. Well, bless you, Dorman, bless you. Uh, bless you, too. Thank you. <laughs> Beth Jardine. Well? Come in. Uh, I, uh... Close the door, oh, will you? Yeah. Rossi. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is there anything I can... There sure is. Zip me up, Jack. I'm Sam. I don't care if you're Boris Karloff. You got hands, haven't you? Well, Zip me up. Uh, okay. You say when. <laughs> when? Can you breathe? Oh, no. You can't have everything. <sighs> Ouch. <sighs> What's on your mind, Jack? Martin Hawks. Sorry. Never heard of him. Look, we're getting along beautifully up to now, honey. Let's not spoil it. You not only know Martin Hawks, you're his sister. What makes you think What's I that know? card stuck over there in the mirror? Bennett and Hatch, attorneys at law. Aha! Uh -huh. The same Bennett and or Hatch who called Martin Monday afternoon and told him his sister wanted to see him here. Now, what's this all about? Uh, I can't tell you. He got a telegram from Mexico. Mexico? Yeah, it upset him something awful. What did it say? Regret must confirm your worst fear. You're dead, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> great. Pretty hilarious, huh? Jack, you just ain't got no idea. I got a piece of advice for you, Jack. Oh? Forget about Monty Hawks and live a long and useful life. Mm hmm I got a tip for you, too. You're in a tight spot. Watch that zipper, Jack. One of the heavier soap opera types Beth was, with a throaty voice and the talent for the smirching reputations. What was the mysterious influence she wielded over young Dr. Hawks? How much did she know about his strange disappearance? What about the cryptic telegram from Mexico City? And what about dinner? The last question I could answer. I stopped at Schroeder's for Sarbrotten and potato pancakes, ran into Larry Mahoney of Homicide, who was off duty, and we stopped in at a handy alley and bowled until 11. I was walking back down Market Street when I passed the flood building, which reminded me of the firm of Bennett and Hatch, who resided there. As a matter of fact, it looked like they were there right now, since the light was on behind the second floor window with their name on it. Now, the sensible thing would have been to call around nine in the morning, but as I seldom do sensible things, I hustled up the stairs and down the corridor to their office. Someone other than Bennett or Hatch had put in some time, obviously. The drawers of a dozen or more file cases had been pulled out and dumped on the floor. The desk drawers, likewise. And to mark it clearly as the work of a thoroughgoing professional, the safe door was off its hinges. All this took me back to the Model A parked in front of your house this afternoon, Agatha, and I was contemplating same when... Hmm. Hello? Bennett. Yeah? Good Christopher, I was scared you wouldn't be there. Try to get you at home. Do it, baby, do it. Pull the string. We'll never make it with this guy. We're through. Pull the string here. Do it, baby. Do it. Make it. Hello? Operator. 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 I finally got someone at the Tortuga Club who knew where Beth Jardine lived, an apartment on Russian Hill. I didn't stop to ask which apartment, and when I got there, I found I didn't have to. All right. Stand back, everybody. Stand back. Dugan. Uh Oh, hello, Sam. What happened? Jane just knocked herself off. Huh? Jumped from a room on the eighth floor. Stand back, you yow! There was Stand no need to, but I looked at her anyway, just to make sure. It was Beth, all right. When she said she was through, she meant it. I was just turning to go, and something big in a tan camel's hair brushed past me and bent over the body. Where is she? Where? Beth! Sister! Beth! 
I recognized him from the snapshot. Wild hair with a four days growth of beard on his lean, handsome face. It was Martin Hawks on the verge of collapse. Officer Dugan and I helped him through the crowd toward the ambulance that had just rolled up, sat him on the running board, and began to question him. Uh, what? What was that again? Your name, your name. What's your name? My, my name. Of course, I... I'll, my name, I, I... I don't know. I don't know my name. It happens to everyone in soap operas, sooner or later. When he filled out the forms on poor Beth Jardine, old Doc Peterson gave Martin a double O, blew his nose, and announced with a twinkle in his eye, Here's to me like young Dr. Hawks has got himself a case of amnesia. Will the mind of young Dr. Hawks come out of the fog? What does he know about the death of Beth? Was it murder or suicide or both? And what of the mysterious telegram from Mexico City? Will Agatha ever discover the terrible secret of young Dr. Hawks? And will stupid Sam ever discover anything? Before we continue, a word from our announcer. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, but tomorrow poor Dennis Day has trouble with his girlfriend Gloria. However, Dennis manages to sing his way out of trouble in his charming, boyish fashion. And say, why not let Dennis help your Saturday evening along, too? And for more music and fun tomorrow, there's the Judy Canova Show, starring Judy in a melodic and carefree half hour of laughs. And Grand Ole Opry with singing MC Red Foley and his special guest, cowboy troubadour Ernie Tubb. <laughs> And now back to the soap opera caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. It's a half hour later now in the sterile whiteness of a hospital room that the three of us, you, Agatha, I, and old Doc Peterson, gather around the pale, quiet form of young Dr. Hawks. Martin. Martin, speak to me. I'm... Uh, 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 Martin, darling. Uh, who, who are you? Agatha, uh, dear. Your own Agatha. Uh, 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 Come, Agatha. Let her leave him be for now. Oh, Doc, I, I can't go on. When a woman reads I know, me. I know. you got to be strong, Agatha. Sam, hmm? we better leave him be for now. Well, you're the doctor. Oh, Doc, what could have done this to Martin? Oh, shock sometimes. You don't mean... Yes, I'm afraid I do. Seeing his sister, then? Could be. Or sometimes it's just a matter of a body getting into such a fix his mind backs off and refuses to have any part of it. The wire from Mexico City. Huh? His terrible secret. The strange threat hanging over him and his sister. Driving one to suicide. And the other... The other... To do this? Well... No wonder poor Martin gave away before this. Sure, sure. And there's still another explanation. How's that, Sam? That he figured amnesia was a nice, easy way not to have to account for what he's been up to for the last four days. Or where he was when the dame took off from the eighth story. Mr. Spade, you're not accusing Martin. There's something of... buzzing around in his little mind. The nurse tells me she got him into a pair of pajamas and tucked him in nice and cozy before we got here. Well? Yes, well? You may not have noticed, Agatha, because he'd pulled the covers up around his neck, but our boy had his clothes back on just now. What? Martin! Hey! He's gone! <laughs> Indeed, he was, was Martin, as we could plainly deduce from the open window and the curtains blowing gently out over the fire escape. Young Dr. Hawks, indeed, had packed up his amnesia, his terrible secret, and his toothbrush, and taken off into the night. 
So I left you sobbing gently on old Doc's shoulder and found me a phone in a drugstore a safe distance away. On the 48th ring, Bennett, the Bennett and Hatch attorneys, answered. He was sleepy. I used all my soft answers, and he used all his hard ones, and finally we got to the point. All right, Spade, all right. The Jardine dame left a sealed envelope with us. What was in it? How do I know? It was sealed, marked personal and confidential, to be delivered to the city attorney in the event of my death. Signed, Beth Jardine Hawks. Signed how? Beth Jardine Hawks. Not Beth Hawks Jardine. No. Is it important? Just a tiresome detail, Bennett. So she brought you the envelope, paid your fee, and you stuck it in the vault for her. Then what? Well, she had us call her brother and tell him to meet her at the Tortuga. Period. That ended our part of it. We didn't even get our feet wet. On the contrary, Bennett, you're up to your ears. In what? Blackmail. Bye. Which explained many things. To wit, A, the wire from Mexico City from a lawyer named Cardoza. B, the murder of Beth Jardine. And C, the reason for young Dr. Hawk's mysterious flight from the hospital. His mind still fogged with amnesia. It did not, however, explain why stupid Sam had kept Croc Morton's business card in his vest pocket for 21 pages without doing something about it. The address was near 3rd and Howard, not one of the better business sections, even for a private detective. I walked down 3rd Street, past the Sherry and Muscatel joints, looking at numbers, and then discovered it wasn't necessary. The old Model A was pulled up in front of white, what might have been a respectable office building before the earthquake, but now couldn't decide whether to be a warehouse or a tenement. Thus far, a harmonious picture, but behind the Model A was something twice as long and three times as shiny with a motor running. Out of place by about $4,000. Out kind of late, aren't you, Nora? <gasps> Sam! Nora. Sam! Nora. Uh, 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 don't reach for the horn. But he told me... Sure, that... and you believed it, like everything else he told you. Come on, get out. I will not get out. Oh, but you will. Or I'll pull you out by your pretty blonde hair. Oh, Come on. You... You... Oh. Ah, that's it. You can't do this to me, Mr. Spade. Nothing can stop Martin and me. We have our right to happiness. Uh-huh. Just the two of you. Chins up, eyes on the horizon. Let the dead past bury its dead. How can you joke it's about... It's no joke, believe me. You got taxi fare? Why? Because you're going to get in my cab, go home, put your hair up in curlers, and go to bed. After saying to yourself 1,000 times, what a lucky little girl you are that Martin Hawks didn't shove you out a window, too. Now, Scoot. Scoot! <laughs> It was a kind of a dark stairway that made me yearn for the comfortable feel of a shoulder holster under my left arm. At the top was a three-and-a-half-watt bulb, and at the other end of the hallway, a crack of light under Crock's office door. Between the two was a cat, more's the pity. So abandoning my stealthy approach, I walked up to the door, turned the knob, stuck my hand in my side coat pocket like Edward G. Robinson, and kicked the door open. Crock was sitting at his desk behind a stack of bills. The closet door was just closing softly. Who was in the closet? And did he still have his toothbrush, his terrible secret, and his amnesia with him? Well, <laughs> Sammy. Yeah. You, uh, you took me up on it right quick, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah, have a chair. I sat on a chair in the corner out of line of the closet door behind the desk. Oh, oh Sammy. Mm -hmm. You got a job for me, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you don't look like you need a job, Crock. Huh? Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, this is nothing. Good day at the track, that's all. What's on your mind? Remember the Blennerhassett job? Huh? The one with the letters before you went up? What are you talking about, sir? The shakedown, Croc. The dame who wanted you to get the letters back, remember? You know, so you got them for her, delivered and collected after you had the photostats made. Sam, you're, you're crazy. Oh. I never done no such thing. You can level with me, Croc. You collected on the photostats for eight years. Oh, wait, Sam. Well, forget it. Anyway, I got another one. Dr. Martin Hawks, married to the soap opera queen, you know. Well, what about it, Sam? She's worth a couple of million bucks and has six weeks to live. As her husband, he's her only heir. Nice spot to be in. Yeah. Only he isn't her husband. Huh? Because the Mexican divorce from his first wife, the late Beth Jardine Hawks, wasn't legal, you know. What? She blew in a month ago and began shaking him down after leaving the marriage certificate and a batch of other papers with some lawyers for life insurance. Sam, I, I just ain't interested. When you hear the payoff, Croc, it's just like the dame with letters. Oh. What do you mean? Hawks hired someone to crack the lawyer's office and get the papers out of the safe. Some smart guy, yeah. An unfrocked private eye who doesn't have a license. Uh, I found out where he had the photostats made, though. I can get copies. Hey, for crying out loud, shut up. 
closet doorknob was turning slowly. I waved him out of the way and picked up the chair. It was all over two seconds after it started. A door flew open. He came out with his terrible secret, which turned out to be a gun. And I wrapped the chair right around his head. So I picked up the gun and croc and young Dr. Hawks, and we all picked up a ride to headquarters. Only one scene remained to be played in today's exciting episode. I, I shall try to be brave, Mr. Spade. <laughs> Sounds like such a cliche now. Uh, good show, Agatha. Good, good show. Good show. Life must go on, you know. Even when a woman... You were born in 1911, I believe. Uh, yes, yes. It says, I say, life must go on, even when a woman reaches... Indeed, it must. Indeed, it must. We have our happy moments and our sad ones, our pleasures, our trials, our joys, and our heartbreaks. And sometimes, Mr. Spade... Yes? Sometimes, at the bottom of our cup of bitterness, we find a pearl. We do? The laboratory, test. A mistake, definitely. They got yours mixed up with someone else's, and you have no incurable disease and many years of happiness ahead of you. Yes, Mr. Spade. But happiness, I wonder, can a woman past 40, whose husband is a convicted murderer, find happiness alone? Uh, well, uh, good show. Period, end of opera. I can't wait for tomorrow's episode. I'll be sure to tune in at this very same time, Cherub, and meanwhile, answer me this. What, Dad? How long will it take a woman past 20 to turn out a 25-page report? <laughs> yes, sir. I'll have the answer after a brief word from our announcer. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, Arturo Toscanini will conduct the renowned NBC Symphony in the fourth of the Saturday concert series. For tomorrow's one-hour performance, celebrated Maestro Toscanini has chosen works by Debussy, Respighi, and Edward Elgar. You're invited tomorrow to the NBC Symphony and Toscanini. Hmm. Oh, dear. Oh, there, there, little girl. No tears now. No tears. They're tears of gratitude, Sam. Mm. When I read all this about other people's troubles, I'm... I'm so grateful to you for the smooth life we have together. Effie. Sam. Effie. Sam. Effie. Sam. That takes about ten seconds. Go ahead. I'm only merely a secretary, but... Shh. It's over now. Matter of fact, we're ten seconds over. Oh, well, Sam, I... I haven't even your wife to be versus... Nothing but peace and quiet. And fairly regular paycheck. With only a course now and then to produce a ripple on the mirror smoothness of our bliss. Oh, that's beautiful, Sam. I thought so. You don't have a, a single terrible secret either. No, but just to keep you interested, dear one, from time to time I shall pick up a piece of paper, read it, let the blood drain slowly from my face, then clasp you to me thusly. Sam! Holding you close and just before striding silently from the room, mutter... In your shell, pink ear. I know. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Join the magnificent Montague and have fun at Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, it's you. What kind of a greeting is that? Oh, it's you. Well, Sam, I may be only your secretary and all that, but I do have feelings, you know. What have I done now? If you recall... Yes? You were supposed to take me to the Geary Theater last night. Yeah? And you never showed up. Well, Effie, I... Oh, I know. Hmm? You'll make up some big story like you always do. Always an excuse. No, I'll try to tell you the truth. And then... The truth. I... 
It'll probably be a story about at least two or three people being killed. Yeah. How you had to be there to straighten the whole thing out. Well, as a matter of fact, And there'll uh... be beautiful women with hair like carved smoke and mm. crimson slashes for mouths. Mm -hmm. You would leave that out. Now that you mention it, Em, there were... shooting and getting knocked out and glass keying your way into houses and anything else you can think of. Effie. Well, if you think that I'll fall for that. Effie, will you please? What's your big fat? Sorry. You've already told everything about it, but the title, I might as well add that. My big fat story is called The Shot in the Dark Caper. Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Spade? No, Effie, don't be like this. I promise you tonight, right after this report, we'll go to the theater. And we'll have dinner, too. Any place you want. Sound good? You're the employer. The faster we do the report, the faster we get out. And I won't even take time out for a drink. So come on, let's go, shall we? Hmm? <laughs> you see? I can't stay mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> they fill it in. Two managing editor, San Francisco Evening Gazette. City, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the shot in the dark caper. Or... Stop the presses. Spade has his pants caught in them. Caught? Dear News Hawk. Oh. The next time you have a bright idea about a story, count me out. There's too much work for the money it pays. And the glory just doesn't exist. I don't mind being knocked on the head, shot at, lied to, double-crossed, and otherwise treated cruelly by circumstance. But to do it all in one night, just so you can have a scoop, and then be referred to in your columns as a Gazette staff member, well... My professional pride was severely injured. I am a detective, sir, and nobody staff member. Well, now that that's off my chest, here in journalistic prose is what happened starting yesterday afternoon. Sam Spade, detective agency. Yes, he is. It's for you, Sam. I'll take it in here, Ed. Spade. This is Woodrow Wilson. Really? Well, I'm sorry. I have Teddy Roosevelt on the other phone. It might take some time. You better try me later. Bye. Spade. Huh? Somehow I thought you were above that sort of carny repartee. I am above nothing, sir, as long as it's ethical. Now, which Woodrow Wilson is this? I'm the new managing editor of the Evening Gazette. Well, welcome to town. What can I do for I you? I have a job you might like. An interesting job and interesting money. How interesting? If you find out what I want, you can almost name your own price. Can you get over here in three minutes? With any sort of a tailwind, I'll make it in two. A new track record. <laughs> Take a seat, Spade. Hmm. Now, uh, what is this interesting job? First, let me say I don't know much about you personally, but you come well recommended. I've tried. Second, this is a confidential matter, and I want it to remain that way. Of course. I'm going to trust you as I would one of my own staff members. Hmm. The police aren't to find out about it until it's all over. And if any other newspaper gets it, you might as well leave town. Woody, old boy, the man doesn't live who can say I ever double-crossed him. For money or love or anything else. I or had love... to say it so we understand each oh. other. I'll take a look at this newest photo. Yes? One of our boys snapped it. What do you see? A street intersection. Old Farrell, I'd say. Two automobiles hit head on. An ambulance, a couple of people, injured, assorted crowd. We took that picture three days ago, Tuesday night, routine accident picture. Mm -hmm. But this morning when we were filing it, I looked at it again. And I noticed something startling. Look at it. It's a shot in the dark, but I smell a story. Well, maybe I have a cold, but uh, whatever it is, escapes me. On the right side of the picture is an apartment house. Mm -hmm. Now count up six floors and look at the fourth window across to the left. Here. Use this magnifying glass. Mm. Well, what do you know? Somebody just fired off a gun. That's it. All you can see is a hand and a smoking gun. Mm. You can't even tell whether the hand's male or female. But somebody shot at something, probably a person, just a second before that picture was taken. You want me to find out why, huh? This calls for a detective, not a reporter. There hasn't been a single homicide, suicide, or gunshot wound reported in the city since that happened. Now, I want the story. Get it. Okay, Chief. Get ready to rip out page one. The apartment house was the Greystone. It was actually an apartment hotel and a little shabby. I entered an hour later with a suitcase and an out-of-town look. The nameplates on the mailboxes showed about five vacancies, including one on the sixth floor. I rang the manager's door buzzer. Good well, afternoon. I'd uh, like to rent an apartment if I could. Ah, come in, come in. Mm. Just uh, 
Drop your suitcase any place. Hmm? My name's Ed Berry. How are you? Your suitcase is leaking. Oh? We charge one price, one seventy-five per night. Well, I uh, I don't have that kind of cash with me or my checkbook. Uh, could I pay you tomorrow? Oh, well, sure thing. Your name? Mark Humboldt. Mark Humboldt. Uh, B O L T. Yes, that's it. Where are you from, Mr. Humboldt? The New York boy, New York. Forty-eight East Fifty First Street. Ah, uh, near Broadway. Mm-hmm. Next to kin? Huh? Any family, uh, relatives? No, no. Oh, you own a car? Look, I'm just running an apartment, not taking out life insurance. Well, you see, there's a state law here that requires us to get this sort of information. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. No car. Uh, the bank account? Corn Exchange Bank. You own any property? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, Albany, New York. Oh. Uh, just how much, would you say? Six feet in a cemetery. I expect to be buried there. <laughs> yeah, well... I guess that about takes care of him. Uh, anything on the sixth floor? Well, why the sixth, particularly? My lucky number. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Maybe later. Right now, we got nothing on the sixth. Come on, I'll show you around. In a few minutes, I was ensconced in room 512. As he stood in the doorway, Ed Bering, the manager, scanned my luggage, my clothes, my ring and wristwatch as if he were trying to estimate what he could get for me from a fence. After he went back to his apartment, I took a stroll up to the sixth floor. Woody Wilson and I figured the gun incident took place in apartment 608. So I counted back from the end of the corridor and found we were right. 608 was silent. I knocked, but no one answered. So I sprung the lock and went in. The place was absolutely empty. No furniture, no nothing. In fact, it was being completely remodeled. Huh? I said it's going to look swell. Well, where did you come from? Oh, gee. I guess maybe I startled you, huh? A little. I was just coming down the hall, you know, taking some of these groceries in, and I saw you standing there. You're new here, huh? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Here, let me uh, carry some of those things. Oh, well, say thanks. <laughs> you know, you're the kind of man a girl should have around. Well, I've tried to convince several of that. Oh, who are you kidding? <laughs> a big, handsome guy like you wouldn't have any trouble getting a girl? Well. At least not if I was the girl. <laughs> Well, you know best. My place is down here. Shall we go? Well, why not? My name's Honey Kane. What's yours? Uh, Mark Humboldt. Gee, what a fascinating name. Oh, not half as fascinating as yours. Really? Mm. Say, isn't it wonderful how fate just throws two people together? The bags of groceries we were carrying had a layer of dust on them, and the bags looked as if they'd made 50 trips to the grocery store. No one had to hit me on the head, Sam Spade, detective. She was small in peroxide, and if you like them stupid, small in peroxide. She lived in apartment 620 with a roommate who was quite a bit different. Prettier, smarter, and quieter. Sandra, I want you to meet this very nice gentleman, Mr. Mark Humberg. Humboldt. Oh, sure, I remember the Mark part, but this is Sandra Lynn. Uh, how do you do, Miss Lynn? Hello. Yes, well, <clears throat> nice day. Great. Well, I... Just put the groceries down here, huh? Oh. There. Now, let's have some fun. Like fun, Mr. Humboldt? Wouldn't be without it. <laughs> You're priceless. Well, come on, let's start with a drink. How about you, Sandra? No, no, you kids have your fun. I'm going out for a walk. <sighs> Mr. Humboldt, you're supposed to be looking at me. An hour later, under the pretext of going out for some snuff, I shook her off and left. The next half hour went to giving the apartment house a thorough casing. I looked at all the names on the mailboxes, and the only one that rang a bell was one Max Barstow, a former heavyweight who never got past club fighting. I inquired about him of charming Ed Berry, the manager. Uh, Max Barstow? Yeah, I tried his apartment. He isn't home. Yeah, well, you see, he won't be home for some time. You see, he took a vacation, went to visit his family in the... Portland. Well, when did he leave? Last Tuesday night. I remember him saying, Ed, I won't be back for a while. Look after things, will you? Well, you have a good memory. Yeah. Hey, can you tell me something about those two girls in 620? Why? One of them made a pass at me. Well, mister, I feel this way. I rent apartments to responsible adults. What they do is their business. You won't get any trouble from me. Now, that isn't what I asked. I always like to be sure. Now, are they honest, hard-working girls? 
I don't know nothing about them. But uh, let me tell you something confidential, mister. Why look a gift horse in the mouth, hmm? Well, I gumshoot around the apartment house some more, and one thing was sure. They were making a number of extensive alterations. For example, in the basement, there was a new cement floor. Said cement floor had been laid, I was told by the janitor, Wednesday morning. The morning after a gun was fired in 608. The same morning on which Max Barstow suddenly left to visit his parents. And about here in the plot, it was dramatically correct to wonder if Max might be sleeping under the furnace with a new cement overcoat covering him. I went back to my apartment for a couple of long ones and some thought. It was getting along about supper time when there was a feminine knock. I guess it to be Miss Room Service herself, Honey Kane. But no. Better. Much better. May I come in? You may. Shall I uh, leave the door open? I'd rather you close it. Anything to make you feel at home? Uh, drink? No. Talk. Oh. What are you doing here, Sam? The name's Humboldt. Mark Humboldt. All right. Play it any way you want. Hmm. But I've seen you around. I know who you are. You move in today, and half hour later, you find our apartment. Why? Your apartment found me. At least half of it did. The gift horse part. Uh, Maybe so, but I figured you helped a little somewhere. Mm Hmm. What are you trying to get on us? Nothing, nothing. I just moved in here for a place to live. With one suitcase and a bottle? Oh, I'm an actor. Look, whatever it is, lay off, will you? I've had enough trouble in my life. Things are just starting to go right. Sandra, I don't know what's on your mind, but as far as I'm concerned, you're clean. All right. Maybe I made a mistake. I'll try to make it up to you sometime. Well, maybe you can start right now. I think I'll open the door again. Now, just a question. Seen anything of Max Barstow lately? I knew it was something. I knew it. No, I haven't seen Max Barstow lately. He went somewhere to visit his family, and I'm telling you, I believe me alone. Something's going to happen to you. You won't write. She stormed out looking lovely all the way, and I sat very quietly for a minute. It was the second time somebody said it. Max Barstow was visiting his family. And that was very interesting because, you see, Max Barstow didn't have any family. When he first started fighting, he was under the aegis of the St. John's Orphanage. So, what was all this rehearsed account of his absence? I watched at the window to see if Sandra Lynn went anywhere, and she appeared on the street. I was out of the room and down the stairs, presto. Ten blocks later, she turned in at a brownstone on Polk Street, went in the first apartment on the first floor. Fifteen minutes later, she hurried out, and I went up to the apartment and knocked. The door opened cautiously. Yes, what is it you want? Is Mr. Uh, Fairchild in? Nobody here by that name. You've got wrong address. Now, just a minute. He used to live here. No more he does. Well, could you tell me where I could find him, Mr. Uh... Sigmund Parkes. I don't know. Try the minute. On the way out, I looked at the card on his door buzzer. It listed his apartment as belonging to a Mr. Rothschild. At the moment, there was nothing to be made out of it, so I went back to the Greystone. And when I got to my room, it was very obvious that I'd been visited during my absence. Yeah? Oh, well, it's you. What happened to my suitcase? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Humble, but I didn't realize it before. You see, that apartment was already rented, so I guess you'll have to find one someplace else. Look, you have four other vacant ones in this apartment house. Give me one of those. Sorry, no vacancy. Well, then give me my suitcase. Uh, yeah, that's the one that leaks. Uh, Just a minute, I'll bring it out, Mr. Humble. I'll go in and get it myself, Mr. Barry. I said stay out. I said I'll go in and get it. He swung at me, I blocked, and stepped into him. He gave way, and I followed in. And then as I moved into the apartment, someone stepped out from behind the door. I turned, but it was too late. I was sandbagged, and the face behind the arm that swung it looked an awful lot like that of Max Barstow. I remember asking myself as I went down, if Max Barstow wasn't shot in room 608, who was? Listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. On Sunday, March 4th, that's one week from this Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air will present radio's most exciting dramatic event. It's a full hour-and-a-half presentation of Shakespeare's immortal Hamlet. John Gielgud will portray Hamlet, Pamela Brown, the Queen, and Dorothy McGuire will appear as Ophelia. The intrigue, beauty, and romance of Hamlet come to life Sunday, March 4th, on Theater Guild on the Air. And 
now back to The Shot in the Dark Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I wasn't out for long, but it was long enough to have been carried out of the apartment manager's place and dumped in an alley. I sat up and rubbed the back of my head and discovered the boys had a sense of humor. Pinned on my chest was a note that said, beat it. This time, when I went back, I had my gun handy to hand. Nobody was home at Mr. Baring's apartment, so for something to do, I looked in on Max Barstow's diggings, 413. I glanced keyed in and turned on the lights. And a search revealed items, a rent receipt showing Max was paid up for two months and intended to stay put. But more interesting were two phony detective badges, a policeman's uniform, and a flash camera. Couple these with a dossier on a man named Sigmund Pulkus, and I knew just what Max had been doing since the fight game stopped paying his bills. It read... Sigmund Polkis, 60 years old, Minneapolis, just sold two restaurants for $175,000. Intends to retire and settle down in San Francisco. That's as far as I got when Honey poured herself on me again. Oh, Mr. Humboldt. Yeah. What are you doing in Mr. Barstow's apartment? Come in, come in. Thanks, you shouldn't be here. Mm. Mr. Barstow ever found out. Honey, honey, you can drop the act. You know who I am and I know who you are. You're part of the bait for one of the oldest rackets in the world. world? The Badger Gang. Who, me? You. All right, Sam. I didn't know who you were at first until Sandra told me. Now, you tell me, what are you doing in Max's room? A number of things. First of all, getting enough evidence on him to give him a free vacation on the state. Second, I wanted to see who would show up and why. Now, what's your story? I just dropped in to see if Max was here. Try again. Sam, if I tell you anything, will you leave me alone? If I can bear it. I came over to get some things from Max. You know Where's he me. staying? Right across the street in the Arlington, 314. Mm-hmm. Ed Baring manages both apartment houses. Why doesn't Max stay here? Who are you working for, Sam? I'm just asking. A client. Not the police? No. Sam, I don't have a thing to do with the mark Max is working on now. Sigmund Polkus. Some old man. Did you hear any shooting here last Tuesday night in apartment 608? I didn't hear a thing, not a single thing. All right, get whatever you came for, but remember this. You tell Max I was here, and I'll tie you into something that'll get you to Hatchapi if it's the last thing I do. Oh, sure. I knew she'd be impressed with that type of threat because her kind of girl lives by playing tag with the law. They want to be it as seldom as possible. I finished the dossier on Pocus and thought a more business-like visit to the old man was in order. What, what is it? Oh, you. I want to talk with you, Mr. Pocus. Come in. I want to talk to you. Now. Now. Stand right where you are. He was pointing a gun in one shaking hand right at my chest. And as close as I could tell, it looked very much like the gun I'd seen in your picture, Wilson. And the hand that held it was the very same hand. I tried to think of something clever to say. At this stage of my life, it would be very easy to shoot you, mister. Look, I came here maybe to help save you a lot of trouble. Now, if you listen to me, I'll... I know why you came here, because I killed Max Barstow. I'll give you a choice. Will you take money, or will I... Will I shoot you right here? I'd take the money, but you didn't kill Max Barstow. Don't tell me what I did when I know what I did. Sandra told me one of his gang members was looking for me. But she doesn't understand the power of money. How much will you take to leave us alone to our happiness? What is much faster to you now that he's dead? Look, I don't want any money. I just want to... I felt like a ghost. The gun was pointed directly at me, but nothing hit me. I was surprised, albeit gratified. The little man must have thought I was wearing a bulletproof vest. He didn't look surprised, though. He just folded. I disarmed him and pushed him down into a chair. I had to do it, I had to. I, I couldn't let you spoil the only bit of happiness I had left in my life. Mr. Polkus, you tried to shoot me, and I'm grateful. It told both of us something. To begin with, you can't kill anybody with blanks in your blanks. gun. Blanks? I don't know blanks. Where did you get the gun? I I always have guns. Always? And you don't know the difference between real bullets and blanks? You got it from Sandra, and she loaded it, right? Maybe you should know, gangster. Look, I'm a private detective. Name of Sam Spade. Now, if you'll help me, I'll help you. When did Sandra give you this gun? Last Tuesday? Yes. Did you use it to shoot Barstow? Yes. Then he couldn't be dead, could he? This gun wouldn't kill a fly. And besides, I met Max Barstow tonight, alive. I saw him fall to the floor and 
blood came out of his coat with my own eyes. Mr. Polkus, you just came from Minneapolis with $175,000. You walked into a shakedown gang. They're after your money. That girl Sandra's just bait. Oh, don't speak about Sandra that way. Sure, she tried to shake me up for money, but only because that meant that Barstow make her. She was a slave. She couldn't get away from him. Why did she stage a phony murder with you killing Barstow? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm so confused. Tell me how it happened. Oh, Barstow posed as a policeman. He found me in Sandra's apartment. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to pay him $5,000, but Sandra told me she loved me, and Barstow was a racketeer. We were to meet in apartment 608 for to pay him. Mm -hmm. She gave me a gun to frighten him, whispered. Instead, I... Killed. Nuts, 5,000. They knew how much money you had, and they wanted to get all of it away from you on a phony murder scare. Sandra doesn't want my money away from me. She loves me. Mr. Polkus, I'm sorry disillusionment should come to you so late in life. But... I say she loved me, and I can prove it. How? This morning, she became Mrs. Sigmund Polkus. <laughs> that made me sit down and think things through a little more carefully. She could have gotten his money, or most of it, without marrying him. Maybe she did love him. Or maybe they felt he was too dumb to pay off. Or maybe she married him so she could murder him. And maybe a dozen other things. His suitcases were packed, and he said that he and Sandra planned to leave town tonight. He'd been waiting for her when I came in, but she was already two hours late. I could think of only one place she could be. So I left poor Mr. Pultus and went to the Arlington. 314, the address Honey Kane had given me. And she was there. You came. I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Nah. I'm scared. No, no, honey, quiet down and tell me what you're scared about. In the bedroom, Max, he's dead. <laughs> a nice job. When'd you find him? Five minutes ago. I was with him before, and then I went out for some Chinese food when I came back. All right, all right. Who else was here tonight? I didn't see anybody. But, but what? He was awful mad at Sandra, said she was double-crossing him, and he wouldn't let her get away with it. I went back to Polkus's place. He was gone, but his bags were still there, so I figured he'd be back. I put out the lights and sat in a chair. Sigmund? Sigmund? <gasps> Go ahead. Go ahead. Ask me what I'm doing here. Where's Polkus? Well, if he's smart, he's on a train back to Minneapolis. I... I'm going to look for him. And you're not going anywhere. Sit down. Oh, yes, I am. No, you're... I said you're not going anywhere unless it's the jail. What are you playing with that district attorney for? Because you killed Max Barstow. Now tell me why. Oh, don't be a joker. Max Barstow's as live as you are. I'm not talking about the phony murder stage for the benefit of Polkas. Barstow was stabbed to death a half hour ago. He wasn't. He was. I saw him. Who? You. Oh, Sam, I didn't. I didn't. I saw him earlier today, but he was all right. You married Polkas to double-cross him, didn't you? You were going to skip town with him, Mark. Well, sure I was, so why would I kill Max? Because he knew what you were going to do, that's why. I tell you, I didn't. I couldn't kill anybody. Why did you... What did you have planned for Polkas? A shove over to the Grand Canyon? No, I... I love the old guy. Come on, we'll drop in at police headquarters. No, Sam. No. Sam. Nothing. I wouldn't take you with the U.S. Mint thrown in. Will you let me go if I tell you what happened? If I tell you who killed Barstow? Well, if you didn't do it, nobody could hold you. For murder, anyway. Bearing. Ed Bering did it. We, we planned the whole thing together. It was a freeze-out on Barstow. Somehow he found out it had to take care of him. I didn't have anything to do with it. I tried to tell him not to. I tried to tell him not to what? Ed. I've got a gun in my hand, Bering. So have I. Which one of us is going to shoot first? You wouldn't shoot. <laughs> But he did. Period. End of report. Sam! Is that all? Well, what do you want? An echo? No! But he shot you and you're all right. Mm hmm. Were they blanks like the other guns? They were not. They were genuine steel jacketed bullets. But, uh, you didn't I... listen carefully enough, Effie. I figured he'd shoot right away. He did once. Just as I jumped sideways and fired two shots back. Did you kill him? No, no. But he's down with a little case of lead poisoning, though, under police guard. You're wonderful. It's true. All right, go type it up. Off with him. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow, you're invited to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of Bruno Walter. 
Featured soloist for tomorrow's performance is celebrated violinist Joseph Figetti, who will be heard in Mozart's brilliant concerto for violin and orchestra. It's the very finest in musical listening, every Saturday with the NBC Symphony. <laughs> I don't understand. Two wits. Well, what happened to nice old Mr. Polkis? Mm. Why wasn't he in his apartment waiting for Sunday? Well, he did just what I thought he should have done. He walked down to the railroad depot and got on the first train for Minneapolis. Who knows? Maybe he's opened a new restaurant. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, what happened to Sandra? Well, she's being held as an accessory to murder, among other things. Well, if they were married... That's well... enough, Effie. That's enough. Do you want me to make everything so simple that everybody will be able to figure it out? No. But, uh... but you what? I get... So confused sometimes. That's most of your charm, Effie. You know, if you were brisk and efficient and cold, we'd never have any fun, would we? I guess not, Sam. <laughs> we do have a good time at times, don't we? Yes, we do indeed. Like right now. Come here. Oh, Fire in a man's veins. Oh. Maddening, that's what. Don't say any more, Sam. I don't know what I might do. I'd love it, whatever it was. I better say good night, Sam. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Sam Spade lives a life of peril. Well, in these days, we all live in a time of peril. Each of us is contributing something to help meet the emergencies that we face as a nation. There is one definite thing that every one of us can do to help. February 28th is being celebrated as Red Cross Day, supported by the people and schooled by years of experience in war and peace in times of disaster the Red Cross has now been assigned unprecedented tasks in the interest of national security and world peace. You can help mobilize the forces of mercy for the protection and defense of your family, your community, and the nation through generous support of the 1951 Red Cross Fund campaign. Join the magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Sweetheart, I just happen to have the tourist lists of handy Italian phrases before me. North Beach never did that to you before, Sam. North Beach never did anybody like it just did me, F. But I thought you said old Bartolomeo just wanted you to drop by for a friendly talk. And some garlic bread and red wine. But does that explain the knife gash on my coat? Your new tweed. My old tweed now, Cherub. You see, it was never meant to be swum in. The bay? Yes. Not again. What else? By now, your keen feminine instinct should tell you this is not the social call, Wonder Girl. As a matter of fact, I plan to drop by presto presto with words and enter a little something I call view of fisherman's wharf from the water or the crab Louie caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Zing, 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 ding, 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 ding. Go on, John, old Sam. Well, go up, huh? Let me see now. Oh, um... Great, great. What's it mean? I found my secretary's list of most used Italian phrases, Sam. Mm. It means, um, I want a carburetor for my what 
I'll remember that. Uh, shall we proceed with the business at hand? Ready, Sam. Date, fill it in. Ah. To Bartolomeo Majore. Copy to Lieutenant Rossi, North Beach Division. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Crab Louie Caper. Dear Bartolomeo. Fisherman's Wharf, as you know, is as changeable as an Italian wench. All smiles and laughter of a Saturday night with the lights blazing in the Chapino Palazzas and the tourists three deep around the steaming cauldrons outside. But it's something else again of an early dawn. Dark and lonely and quiet, except for the mutter of engines as the crab boats nose out into the fog that hang over the gate. Last night was somewhere in between. The lights were blinking out as I left my cab and walked over to your place of business. A gaudily painted building at the foot of the wharf with a red, yellow, and blue sign reading Museo Maggiore. Curios, souvenirs, waxworks. Admission, ten cents. <laughs> Who is it? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo called me. He isn't here. Plus, he's grotto at the end of the warp. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Look, is there anything I can... Sorry. Except for Foskey's at the very end, the wharf was dark now. It seemed early, as if something had interfered with business as usual, and the late customers had been brushed off a couple hours ahead of time. I peeked through a hole in one of Foskey's window shades and saw why. It looked like the entire population of North Beach was inside. Okay. If everyone is ready... Un momento. Who's it this? Me? Yes, you. What do you want? I'm Sam Spade. Bartolomeo Major I sent for me. Bartolomeo. Eh? Uh, Con il signor Spade? Ah, si, sí, si. Sí. Obrigatissimo, Pasqui. Out there, Mr. Spade. You are uh, wondering why we are here? Well, as a matter of fact, I am, Bartolomeo. I thought that... I know, I know. It, uh, it's about my son, Louis. My son, my only son. Oh, he's uh, inside? No, no, not inside. Out in the darkness somewhere. Cold and alone. You, uh, you mean he... See, six days now they have searched for his body. Oh, well, when did it happen? One week today. Crab boat? His boat, the San Felipe. And was he alone when it happened? You detectives... You strike the point. My Louis, always, always he fish alone. Until this time. Who went out with him? Dominic Torrio, his friend, Dominic. This gathering is assembled in Dominic's uh, honor, you see. You mean a uh, hearing or something? Something more than that. Come. Listen to that. Yeah. I'm a sick! In my belly, I'm a sick! This old friend, Buffo! Faster, you should sell him the ticket! Keep your temper, Aldo. Facts, facts, huh? All right, facts. Six years, Louis fish the crab alone. Each day, he's a layover, close the breaker line, and string the pot. Each day, he's a bringing the San Felipe home, honky dokie. That's right, everybody. But no, no. Until one fine day, Dominic can hit the goal with Louis to help. Help. Aldo, Aldo, we must deal in facts. Dominic is suspended. And you know why? Because he's a water rosalia. That's the why. Oh, no. No. You see how it is. Who's Rosalia? You must have seen her at the museo. Crying? Yes, with reason. Next week, she and my Louis were to be married. It's tough. You think this Dominic was in love with her, maybe? I think nothing, senor. Two men, friends, alone in a boat in a heavy fog. One of them dies... The other says it is an accident. It is not for us to think or make guesses. Say, what am I supposed to do? In the records of the police, senor, my Louis died in an accident. Mm -hmm. In the hearts of his friends, he was murdered. For my sake, for Dominic's, for the sake of us all, we must know the truth. Mm -hmm. For this, I prefer to employ one who is professional and impartial. Come, yeah. we go in. Again, Dominic. How far was the boat from Seal Rocks? Oh, 100 yards, I think. I'm throwing a tail in the storm. Heard the break. Oh, he's alive. Silencio. Silencio. Let Dominic tell the story. Go on now. You had dropped the last crab pot over the side. Then? Uh, something went wrong with the motor. Louis told me to look at it. I went below, then it happened. 
Louie was leaning over the gunnel. We untangled a float, and the sea took us by the stern. We broached. I saw him go over and plunge into the white water. I brought the boat about then. For two hours, I yelled, I circled around, I blew the whistle, everything. Then the Coast Guard came. Bosky, I swear it, that's all I know. I never saw him. Ah, Impossible! Silencio! Silencio! My brothers, it was your will that I sit here in judgment of Dominic Torrio. Before I go on, are there any more questions you have to ask him? Are there any among you who have evidence to offer against him? So be it. You know as well as I, there is only one verdict here. The charge is dismissed. The court is adjourned. Everyone was still for a second, like a big tableau. Basque, white-haired and dignified on the platform, looking down at Dominic, and the rest of them all on their feet now, boring holes to him with their eyes. He was the first to move, turning slowly, walking out through the crowd toward the door, looking tentatively from face to face, knowing now he hadn't been acquitted at all, as one by one they turned their backs on him. I felt terribly sorry for Dominic, until he walked past me and I got a look at his face, at his eyes. In my racket, I see that look more often than the next guy. I never saw it any clearer than I did now. It was fear and hatred and guilt. So I left you talking to Fasque, Bartolomeo, and walked back down to the wharf to the museo. Rosalia. Rosa. I told you Bartolomeo is not here. I've seen Bartolomeo. I want to talk to you. Sit down. I don't want to... T- Sit down. Oh. That's a good girl. It was quite a place, the Museo. A catch-all for everything nautical you'd run across in 60-odd years of living on the sea or next to it. From a 10-foot shark pickled in formaldehyde to a life-size figure of Captain Kidd, complete with drawn sword, lace cuffs, and treasure chest at his feet next to the door. I turned back to Rosalia, sitting on a rum keg under a flickering hurricane lamp, the only light in the room. What do you want of me? Bartolomeo wants the truth about what happened on the San Felipe. They're deciding that at the meeting. They already did. They did? You mean Dominic... How did they decide? Dismiss the charges. No evidence, no witnesses. It was the only thing Fosky could do. You feel better? It uh, doesn't bring back my Louis. No, it doesn't. Dominic's going free now from both the law and his people. No vengeance for Louis. Why were you crying when I came by tonight? Haven't I the right to cry with my Louis? Drop it. Huh? Why didn't you go to the meeting, afraid to give yourself away? I didn't feel like it, that's all. You're a Sicilian, Rosalia. Vengeance is pretty important to you. If you'd loved Louie, you'd have been in there screaming for Dominic's scalp. You shut your mouth. But no, you sat home crying, not for Louie, but for Dominic, right? How long had it been going on? Did you know Dominic was going to kill him when they put out in the San Felipe? Why would Dominic kill him? Well, that's a stupid question. He's in love with you. In love with me. <laughs> in love with me. Drop it. Drop it, Rosalia. In love with me? Oh, I wish it were so. Huh? He killed for me. Is that what they say? Oh, it's all very flattering. Very. I love Dominic. I've always loved Dominic since I was a little girl. I threw myself at Dominic. And I begged him to marry me. That's not easy for a girl to do, Mr. Spade. I begged him and I promised to work for him to be a slave. You know what he did? He laughed and he spit upon me. And you, you stand there and you tell me that he murdered for the love of me. He wouldn't walk across the street. All right, all right. Take it easy now. Come on, take it easy. So, so I do the silly woman thing. I, I promise myself to Louis, to crazy Louis, to a madman. Crazy? You don't believe that, huh? Louis the Great, your campione. A champion of the crab fisherman who dares to fish right on the breaker line. Catches more crab than anyone else. Louis the fearless. Do you know why he's fearless? He's too crazy to be afraid. What do you mean? He mutters. He, he talks to himself of great riches. Of thousands of dollars. Of him and me. Louis the crab fisherman and me living in the finest house in North Beach. When was this? Last week. He went up in Bartolomeo's attic one night and he came down with a big hunk of his raw wax from the waxworks. The tresor, he called it. A stupid lump of wax. And he held it up before me, so. And he says with a mad gleam in his eye, From this, Rosalia, 
From this, I will carve for us the biggest, finest house you can dream of. Here, look. What's Captain Kidd got to do? Uh, he puts it in the treasure chest. See? Hmm? You will keep this a secret, Rosalia, he says, if you love me. And he laughs again like a madman. Me love Louis Majori? I hated him. Too good to be phony. The triangle notion had to go. You could hardly blame Rosalia for thinking he was crazy. And the treasure chest was a hunk of tallow. Not a very fresh hunk at that. And Louis's routine with it must have hit her like the graveyard scene from Hamlet. Therefore, having no theory, nor evidence, nor witnesses, I also had no motive. As always in situations like this, I did the sensible thing. I went home and went to bed. Or I thought I went to bed. Hello? Spade? Yeah. I got a tip for you. No? Find yourself a nice dirty divorce case somewhere and stay out of North Beach. Well, this almost sounds like a threat. All in advice. There's a hundred bucks in the mail for you. You'll get it this morning. Plus a bribe? A gift. Can I keep it if I don't play? If you don't play, you won't need it. I uh, suppose it's useless to ask who this is. Louis Majori. Say that again? Louis Majori. Shall I spell it? You might explain it. You talk to Rosalia. Figure it out for yourself. Sure, sure. So she never loved you, and you knew it. So you go over the side when the comber hits, swim ashore, then discover they think you're dead and decide to leave it that way rather than go through with a wedding. You got it. I got more. So life without Rosalia in North Beach is impossible. You can't face the shame and loose talk that goes with a busted wedding. So you're going over the hill and find a new life for yourself. Wait a minute, Spade. Oh, there's more, there's more. So you're tossing over a car, a bank account, a boat worth $7,000. Walking out on your old man to say nothing of three years' apprenticeship and six years of hard work to get where you are. I understand perfectly. And you're being a little insulting. I make a lot of my dough with my big flat feet. But I do make some of it with my head. Now try again. You don't believe I'm Louis Majori? That is the general idea. And it might surprise you to know that five minutes ago I was ready to chuck the whole anti-pasto. Now I'm back in with both feet. What's with the music box? Nothing. Tell me, would you know Louie if you saw him? I've seen his picture. Fine. I guess I'll have to prove it to you. If I satisfy you I'm Louie Majori, will you stay home? Scott. Out's on Now where do we prove it? You know Costellani's grotto? Halfway out in the wharf, yeah. There's a ramp running around behind it. I'll see you there in a half hour. I know just what you're going to say, Bartolomeo, but I didn't go alone. Roscoe was right there with me, with his safety off. It was the kind of spot San Francisco puts on once a year for the tourists. Just to nail down its position as runner-up to London. I had to feel my way along the row of dark chowder houses to Catalani's. Except for the foghorn and the lapping of the water below, there wasn't a sound. The only cheerful thing in the picture was Roscoe, who was now out of my pocket at the ready. I eased up to the corner of Castellani's. There was an alley between it and the next building, leading around on the ramp over the water. Hey. I could see the glow of his cigarette first. Then I made him out in a slouch hat and overcoat. He was standing at the rail. Spade. Right here. Well, you satisfied now? I'll let you know. I moved out from the side of the building and walked toward him. He must have known about Roscoe because he didn't move. Just let me come right up next to him. I was stupid, sure. But it wouldn't have worked for him except for the fog. Two feet away, I saw what I thought was Louie. It was a booby trap. The hat and overcoat were slung over a piling with a burning cigarette on the rail next to one of his sleeves. I rolled to one side just in time. The knife slashed through the padding on my left shoulder and he was on me. Roscoe went into the brink and I took on the arm with a knife with my two hands 32 feet. Unhappily, overlooking a spare foot, he knew what to do with it. I went through the railing like in a silent version of the sea wolf, arriving thus in the limpid and soothing waters of San Francisco Bay. At the moment, I was not sorry. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. chimes mean good times on NBC. Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents one of the greatest dramatic undertakings in the history of radio. It's a full hour and a half adaptation of Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet. The immortal lines and matchless beauty of Hamlet come to life Sunday, 
with John Gielgud, Dorothy McGuire, and Pamela Brown in Theater Guild on the Air. And a reminder, this Sunday also means another gala broadcast of The Big Show. <laughs> And now back to the Crab Louie caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Wetting my finger and holding it up in the wind, I quickly determined where North was and just as quickly decided there was no percentage in swimming the Golden Gate. A bright blur on my starboard bow called to mind the old saying, where there's a light, there's light. So I headed there. Three strokes this side of exhaustion, I pulled up at what proved to be a landing with a Jacob's Ladder, at the top of which I found the rear entrance to Foskey's, or more accurately, Foskey's private office. The door was open. Huh? Oh. I'm Sam Spade. I've been swimming, if you're wondering. But Tolomeo told me about you. He didn't say you were crazy. Well, maybe he didn't know. You uh, wouldn't have a brandy lying around loose, would you? Well, sure. Sit down. Thanks. I uh, think I saw Louis tonight. Louis? Impossible. Where? Behind Castellani's. Yeah. Bust you, Fosque. Ah. Oh, hit me again, will you? Yeah, but uh, what about Louis? Call me up. Said he'd meet me there. Just tried to knife me. Oh, but, but it's impossible. Is it? Why would he play dead? And why would he try to kill you? Ah. Maybe he's crazy. Well, how do you mean? You've heard of the dear old lady who had the trunk full of pancakes, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Louis saves old tallow. Captain Kidd's treasure chest at the museo is full of it. Who told you this? Rosalia showed it to me. Uh, may I? Uh, help yourself. Thanks. Might be a good idea to call another meeting and tell the people. <clears throat> Make it easier for Dominic. It's funny. There was a whole meeting here. I alone got it is guilt. Good thing they made you the judge or he might be six feet under by now. Got a cigarette? In the box there next to the phone. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I went right along with him, too. Shows how wrong you can be when... When what? When you, uh, when you go by emotions and not by evidence. This is, uh, quite a cigarette box. <laughs> yes, it stops when you put it down. Hmm? Well. I, uh, suppose now you'll drop your assignment? Sure, sure. I'm a detective, not a psychiatrist. You've got a lunatic running around. That's your problem. Good night, Fosky, and thanks for the brandy. If Roscoe had been along, I might have played it differently. But when you're sitting across a coffee table from a guy you suddenly realize has the wet cement already, you do what I did. Make polite noises and concentrate on getting out on two feet. It was seven to three. Dominic was stashed in a handy closet listening to the whole thing, which was handy since the next obvious move was his room in a house on Jefferson Street. A rooming house owned and operated by a four corsage bosom type lady known as Mama Luca. Oh, senor, I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. You're scared, Mama. Did Dominic threaten you? No, no, no don't ask me. Look, I... look. He killed Louis Majori. I gotta know why. I don't know why. I don't know nothing about it. Louis came here? Yes. Yes, Louis came here the night before it happened. Why? Oh, I don't know. He was all excited. A handful of wax. Wax? You know. What about it? He showed it to Dominique, and they go into his room and talk, and then he, he ran off to send a telegram. Telegraph office, huh? Well, since it's official business, I can let you read the office copy. Here. here. Yeah. This message just came in tonight. Mm. Dominic Torrio. Regarding your inquiry, analysis of samples sent here by Louis Majori, highly promising. If quality uniform and weight correct, would estimate value minimum $60,000. Hartley Associates, Vancouver, B.C. A lump of smelly stuff that looked like old tallow, picked out of the ocean and worth $60,000, was a strong enough clue for even stupid Sam to pick up. I left the telegraph office on the double and pulled up at the Museo Maggiore ten minutes later. He was too busy to notice me. I slid a marlin spike out of a rack next to the rum keg. Uh, locked. Must be locked. I hate to do this, Foskey. Uh, wait, wait a minute, Spike. Wait a minute. The next voice you'll hear will be the nurse with the breakfast tray. But tell him, Eel. What have you... Look. What? What have you done? His honor was playing Pandora with Captain Kidd's treasury. Treasure box? Yeah. Why? Who is it? Who... Fosky. Surprised? Fosky? 
Why would he, of all people? He likes a buck as well as the next one. Possibly even more, when there are 60,000 of them. 60,000 dollars? Yeah. Is he mad? Like a fox. Here, let me pry this cover off. There. What is this? Well, it may not look like much to you and me, but to a perfume manufacturer, it's prettier than the Venus de Milo. Tadlo? Ambergris. It's what happens when a whale gets a tummy ache. Louis must have run on to it ten days ago. I dream me six dozen dollars. Yeah. That's the big why of it, Bartolomeo. What now? You think fast? He won't talk, neither will Dominic. They're next and they know it. Still two men alone in a fog in a boat. See. Si. There were only a witness. There was a witness. Hmm? The eye of God was on Dominic when he did it. And the judgment of God is swift and is sure. Dominic knows it. You think so? I know Dominic. Why are you ask? There's a way to find out. What time is it? Half past one. There's time. Where do you keep your razor? Razor? Yeah. I'm going to shave Captain Kidd. Which I did, finishing around 2 a.m. And during the next three hours, I got wet, cold, and seasick in the order named. But made it back to the museo in time for a couple of stiff horns of grappa before you and I hustled down to the wharf where Dominic was picking up bait for his crab nets. Dominic? Huh? Oh, the Palomeo. And the Senor Spade. I remember Mr. Spade. Yeah, last night in back of Catalani's. I don't know what, what you're, you're talking, talking about. about. Sure, Dominic. It's all a horrible mistake. Lay off me, will you? Heard what Bosky said, didn't you? They dropped the charges. I'm innocent. They cleared me. That's just why we're here. We we want to make it up to you, my boy. What's in your mind? You did Louie a great favor, Dominic. When his 32 crab pots got too much for him to handle, you went along to help him. Today, we're going along to help you. Now, uh, when do we cast off? There's a float up ahead. What color? Yellow and red. Is that yours, Dominic? That's mine. Great, great. Pull up alongside. Well? What's this all about? I told you, Dominic. You're lying. Going... What are you trying to do? Break me down? He's dead in an accident. You hurt with Bosky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Forget it, Dominic. Forget it. We love you like a brother. I, I told the truth. I told the truth. What are you trying to do? Torture me? Is that what you want? Revenge? No. The matter is in other hands now. What? You mean? There is always one witness. Isn't there, Dominic? Oh. <laughs> That's what you mean, huh? Is that why you came to tell me that? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Hold the wheel, Spade. I'll bait my net. I'll spit in your eye one day, old man. One day when you get smart. You and a whole lousy we war. We both watched him hold the line. Oh, get playing it on the deck. Prattling to himself like a little kid whistling in the dark. He was a lousy actor, pale under his sunburn and drenched with I sweat. I won't let you forget Up it. Now, coil by I coil. To prove then it began to come slower. And make it stick. When I can prove it in court, I'll sue you for your plea. I'll... Hey, what's the matter here? What's pulling on this line? Maybe it's your conscience, Dominic. It's, it's heavy. It's... What? The it... Lord moves in strange ways. Hey, can't get it up. I... Let me help you. There we go. One, two. Up. Oh. Louis! Get away from me! Let it go! Louis! No! I hauled Louie up onto the deck, and a grisly sight he was, too, with a knife still sticking in his back. I figured that that was where Dominic would put it, and I was right. Not that it mattered, because Dominic wasn't thinking logically from the moment he saw Louie's body tangled in his crab line. He sang us all 50 verses then and there and repeated them for the police stenographer later when we got him to headquarters. It looks like a first-degree rap for both him and Fosky, but I'm waiting till it happens before telling him the corpse was Captain Kidd, minus beard and ruffles. Period. End of report. Sam, again and again I rediscover you. And each time a new facet, a new thrill. You're just wonderful. It's true, true. But it pleases me to hear it from you, F. And so I propose to reward you in a fitting manner. First, Back-salary? tut tut, a carburetor for your washerette. And second, back salary. Ten free tickets to the Museo Maggiore. Third, back salary. An invitation to accompany me, your employer, to browse upon two bowls of Chipino tonight at Castellani's. And fourth, I give up. Back salary. Sam. Counted, girl. Counted, and bless you. The uh-huh. watcherette, complete with carburetor, will call at your door in precisely one hour. <laughs> Until then, then. 
Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited to a one-hour concert tomorrow by the renowned NBC Symphony under the direction of noted conductor Wilfred Pelletier. Featured soloist on tomorrow's symphony performance is Helen Traubel. For the world's greatest music, hear the NBC Symphony tomorrow and every Saturday. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Through the years, the Red Cross has helped the victims of disaster and helped protect the health of our nation. Today, with the country rising to meet the challenge of possible aggression, the Red Cross has been asked by the government to undertake additional tremendous tasks. A goal of $85 million must be reached during the 1951 Red Cross campaign. This year, when you support the Red Cross, you'll be helping to mobilize for the defense of our nation. Join the Magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency? Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam. Ah, well, Paul is forgiven, like I told you. How can you forgive me, Sam? I almost killed you. Well, why kick yourself, F? You would have done the private detective profession a great favor. Oh, don't say that, By Sam. removing from its roles the only operative in San Francisco stupid enough to shake an apple tree for an entire evening trying to pick up an apron full of bananas. But they all can't come out right in the end, Sam. Ah, but you haven't heard the postscript, Angel. Postscript? Postscript, indeed. Batten down the hatches and warn all within earshot that they're about to catch stupid Sam, the incarnate in a new act. For during the next 29 minutes and 30 seconds, I shall don the mantle of Don Quixote, shoulder my battered glance, and tilt that windmills in an object lesson to the gullible entitled The Spanish Prisoner Caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. to Miss Marjorie Loveland, Barkhaven Apartments from Samuel Spade, still license number 137596. Down, F.A., down. Subject, the Spanish prisoner caper. Dear, dear Marjorie. When they made you, darling, they threw the mold away. In this day of the emancipated, self-sufficient, 100% competent female, it came as a fresh breeze and a boost to my masculine ego to run across a lady, white-haired and fragile withal, who needed protection. After meeting you, I knew what the fellow had in mind when he wrote, Heaven will protect the working girl. As a matter of fact, you could have been the very girl, since you and the song were about the same vintage. Uh, do please sit down, Mr. Spade. Uh, 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 may I fix you some tea? No, thanks. Uh, I planned to come to your office, but I, I decided I just couldn't risk going out at this time. Oh, why that? Well, he might come, you see. Yes. And I'd never forgive myself if I was out. Oh, who's this? Senor Palmer. Oh. Oh, he's more than a week overdue now. And I'm on pins and needles. Mm. I gave him my address here at the Brockhaven. But there's the Brocklebank and the Brockhurst and the Brockmorton and, and, and the Brock. 
It would be so easy for him to become confused being a stranger in town. Well, I'm a native. I'm confused myself. Well, I thought perhaps you could locate him. He should be back from Mexico by now with Don Luis. Don Luis. Dear me. So many things could happen to them. Walking the streets with all that money. What money? The gold and the precious gems. Mm. Uh, How about starting all over again? Why? Haven't I made myself clear, Mr. Spade? Well, I have the end fairly straight. Yes, but if you'll give me the beginning, we'll have everything. Oh. Uh. Oh, Uh, well. Well, I I suppose the beginning was uh, three weeks ago. Where? In the lobby of the Grand Hotel for Women. I see. I I was staying there temporarily while I was waiting for this apartment, you see. Mm -hmm. So? So, the day I got word I could move here, I packed up and had them take my things out to the taxi. Then I went to the desk and got my money from the vault. Oh, how much? Eight hundred and forty dollars. Cash? Yes, in bills. My annuity money had just come from the east. Well. Well, I just put the bills in my purse and was starting out the door when it happened. Mm Mm-hmm. This voice came over my shoulder. A soft Latin voice saying, Senorita, I come to you on a matter of terrible urgency. And lo and behold, it was Senor Palmera. How did you know? Oh, I have a feeling for those things. (laughs) Go ahead. Well... His uncle, Don Luis Alvaro, was in terrible trouble, he said, in prison in Mexico City on some sort of trumped-up political charge. Ah, and the family, though noble, was financially impoverished. Uh, Yes, except... Except for a casket containing the family jewels and an assortment of priceless heirlooms, all hundreds of years old, hand-wrought of the finest virgin gold. Mr. Spade, however... Said caskets and its precious hoard being hidden away in a secret place known only to Don Luis. All he needs is a paltry $840. It it, it was a thousand. I went to the bank. A paltry thousand dollars to bribe a jail official, and presto, Don Luis goes free, unearths the casket, and rewards you with an ample share of the family treasure. Mr. Spade, you've talked to Senor Palmera. Nope. How badly do you need the dough? Uh, need it? Why, good heavens, Mr. Spade, it's all I have until next June. There's a small pension from the school board in Keokuk, but... Dear me, I... I don't know just how... Mr. Spade. Do you mean he... He isn't coming back with my money? The truth of the matter, Marjorie, was that you'd fallen for the Spanish prisoner's swindle. A hoary old chestnut that goes back to the day of P.T. Barnum and before. But you look like if I gave you an honest answer, you'd dissolve into tears. As I said, I was in one of my heaven and spade will protect the working girl mood, so I made up a dishonest one. Mrs. Spade, will you... I'll uh, try and look him up. Maybe it's all a terrible misunderstanding. Oh, good. Effie? Bree? What'd you say? Miss Perrine. Oh, Sam Spade, detective agency. Oh. Mr. Spade is... This is Mr. Spade, charming one. Oh, Sam, I'm sorry. Yes. Dorothy's here, and I'm trying to learn to knit Argyle socks. Well, fine. Drop all stitches and look in the file for me, will you? I remember getting a circular a while back on a con man who was running the Spanish prisoner around here. What would it be under, Sam? Um, Spanish prisoner? Con games, obsolete. Get out the file. Oh, just a minute. It's Sam, Dorothy. Count those stitches while I look in the file. Um... Confidence game. Oh, here. You told me to knit two and slip two, I'm sure. Sam! Yeah? I found it. His name's Pedro Rodriguez. Rodriguez? Uh, there's no address, but it mm. says he um, habitually associates with somebody named Lolita Montoya. Sounds Spanish. Slightly, slightly. Any address for her? Um, 615 Mason Street. Fine, fine. And that's all there is, Sam. Mm-hmm. Oh, golly, I'm so mixed up with these darn argyles. Oh, what's so tough about that? Well, you ought to try it. Time. What row are you on? 27th. Knit three and slip one, she says, and I don't... She's wrong, wrong, wrong. Knit two, slip one, knit one, pass one, and knit one. You got it? Damn! How versatile! Nothing, nothing at all. I've been going out with a gray lady. (laughs) 
615 Mason Street was a very large apartment building with a usual brass plate in the entry listing the inhabitants, among which I was happy to note was Lolita Montoya, apartment 408. I picked up the house phone and pressed the button. Yeah? Telegram for Lolita Montoya. Lolita isn't here. Lolita? My Lolita? Who is calling? Just the telegram, Pop. Stick it in the box, eh? Uh, money order. Somebody has to sign for it. But it may be important. I will stick care of it, understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. Sonny? Yeah? Climb back into that cab I saw you get out of. Hustle over to Western Union and tell the president Lolita's on a vacation. Get it? Score for you now. Hello? Hello? Nothing daunted, I punched a few bells until one of the less suspicious tenants gave me the front door buzz, walked in and took the automatic elevator to the fourth floor. Or I should say toward the fourth floor, since halfway between the third and fourth, she quit cool. The elevator, that is, but there were devices for such things. I pushed the button marked emergency, and it took me only 50 minutes to get out, assisted by the janitor, the manager, and 12 tenants. The doors on the fourth floor, it seemed, had been carelessly pried open and held that way by a magazine carelessly stuck in the crack. Continuing my stealthy approach to 408, I found my man and his pal had somehow sensed I was coming and run off without stopping to close the door. The apartment was filled with cigarette smoke and not much else, a bed, an empty dresser, and a table on which were one pot half full of foul black coffee, a little pointed gadget that looked like a nut pick, and a handful of metal shavings. I was contemplating what connection, if any, this had with your missing thousand bucks when... Yeah? This is Diveston, Pedro. I oh. just wanted to inquire how everything is coming along, if it all. See, si, Gray. How much? Well, there's a thousand. Is it good? Oh, si, boy. What do you think? Well, Pedro, this here is joyous news. Like you said, Pedro, our Spanish prisoner is a valuable man. Huh? I must hustle over to the lighthouse and inform the leader. The lighthouse? Uh, she has been very conscientious in the rule, Pedro, very Oh, no, see, Gray. It's not every girl who would sell out her grandfather so readily, Pedro. Nope. We must not take Lolita for granted. I will give it a new rumble, and we'll see you tonight at Simplex. Right? See, si, right. Au revoir, Pedro. Au revoir? What au revoir? Oule, Stevie. The only lighthouse I knew was a gin mill perched midway down the Embarcadero, south of Market, surrounded by shoals strewn with human wrecks of all description. A place you might find shell game men and carne grifters, but hardly a habitat for a con man smooth enough to work the Spanish prisoner. The lighthouse keeper, who looked like he'd retired from the sea after a losing battle with Moby Dick, was bent over a pinball machine next to the door. As far as I could see by the one light in the joint, get up. it was empty. Get up, 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 ooh, 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 ooh. Hmm. Oh. Too bad, lighthouse keeper. Yeah. Yeah, what do you have? Well, beer when you're ready. Do you know Pedro Rodriguez? Yeah, worked for me once, a couple of years ago. I can't have... Why? Yeah, he's a swab. Only on this nickel he ever made was when he was here. All right, get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, crooked swab is Pedro Rodriguez. He's up to something right now, if you ask me. Spanish prisoner? Oh, you mixed up with it too, huh? Nope, I just want to be. How does it go? Well, I don't know much about it, only it seems to smell. See, Pedro was sitting at the bar the other night with another swab, talking about an old Spanish gent who's going to make him a million dollars. Just come over from Spain. Get up, get up, get up. Get up. <laughs> 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 nice shot. Ah, body English, pure and simple. Yeah, so what about the Spanish gent? Well, I didn't hear no more about that. Hey, I'll tell you what you do. Mm. You ask Lolita about it. Anything Pedro is mixed up in, she generally knows about. Good. Where do I find Lolita? Uh, let's see. I ain't sure whether it's the third or the fourth. Third or fourth what? The booth from the back there. Oh. She's been sitting there all night writing letters. Uh, you better be careful, though. She got an awful temper. Yeah, thanks, lighthouse keeper. Uh, how about the beer? Sure. Hey, Larry! Draw one! <laughs> So Larry drew one, and I took it down to the bar to a point opposite booth number four, which indeed contained Lolita, a fragile little thing wearing a turtleneck sweater marked 
Stillman's gym. The table was covered with writing paper, and her alabaster brow was a mass of unsightly wrinkles as she chewed the end of her fountain pen. I'd no sooner settled down when the front door opened and what appeared to be the reincarnation of Gargantua the gorilla, only with clothes, steamed down the aisle and slid in next to Lolita, who was not alarmed at all. <laughs> Lolita, I bear tidings. Oh, listen to this. I am making progress. Uh, Grandfather dear, you cannot know how dire is the peril into which I have been thrust. Okay. Possibilities, possibilities. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Grandfather Beloved. Mm. As I take up my pen in hand, I am overcome with fear. Things look very black indeed. I have fallen into the clutches of a... <laughs> Darvison, what are you grinning at? I have just conversed with Pedro in the telephone. We are in. Really? Yeah. Hey, you mean no more letters? No more. Pedro is exalted. He says that... Hmm. What's the matter? Are we interfering with your train of thought, Buster? No, 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 no. Go right ahead. I'll just sit here and drink my beer. Wait a minute. Now, look, George. There is plenty of bar down near the front door. Oh, leave him be, Lolita. He's just a schmuck. I'm not so sure. He's got an honest look about him I do not like. What is on your mind, George? Pedro. Uh, Pedro, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's getting careless. Shortchanged a friend of mine a thousand bucks. I just just take it. Ah, this man is subtle, Stivey. Yeah. Um, you are anxious to put the bite on Pedro for a grand, right? Uh Huh? That is, uh, unless Pedro wants to take a five-year rap, it's up to him. Five-year rap for what? Stupidity. They ought to know better than to try to get by with a Spanish prisoner, honey. Spanish prisoner? Who knows? What did I tell you? It's a shakedown. Are you? Relax, Ivan. Violence will get you nowhere. Out of my way, Ivan. Then I'll show the kid horn. Play off, Lolita, not the gun. I said get out of my way. You better let me have it, baby. Lolita, temper, temper. gun with one hand while Lolita chewed on my other one. Stuyvesant, meanwhile, catching my head under his arm like a nutcracker and kicking me in the stomach with his knee. This went on for some time, then I became vaguely aware of Stivey's fist, as big as a ham, coming up from the floor. He caught me on the side of the head, and I skidded down the marble floor, past the row of booze like a ball in a bowling alley, scoring a ten strike on the pinball machine, which leaned drunkenly over me, stuck out its coin drawer, and flashed a red light in my face, reading, foul ball, try again. Stupid me, I did. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery tomorrow on NBC. For music, your hit parade brings you the top tunes in the land, as selected by you and presented by Raymond Scott's orchestra, Eileen Wilson and Snooky Lanson. For mystery, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, an intrepid adventurer in international intrigue who travels to all corners of the world. Wherever there is danger, romance, and mystery, there you will find The Man Called X. And now back to The Spanish Prisoner Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I came to with my head jammed between the brass rail and the bar next to what proved to be the lighthouse keeper's left shoe. Parked, as always, in front of the pinball machine. Larry, that's up front. Oh. Uh, get up, get up, get up, oh. get up, get up. Oh. <laughs> Where are they? Top holes all filled with three balls to go. Uh, congratulations. How about Lolita and the mug? Oh, Deb. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> oh, Deb? Ah, uh, took off, blast him. I had 780,000 points run up, and they had to go throw you at the machine, cause a tilt. And Larry! Oh, 
I sat until the buzzing in my ears quieted down and tried to hark back to the phone conversation with Stiley in the apartment. It came eventually, and I pried mine host, the lighthouse keeper, away from the pinball machine and sat him down next to me with the yellow and standard sections of the telephone book. Uh, Simplex Bar Supply? No, no. Simplex uh, Easy Do Garden Furniture? Nope. Uh, how about Simplex Pretty Company? 509 Sansom Street? Nope. No, no, uh, no. Simplex Office Files? Simplex Service Station? 12th and... Uh... No, no, no. Well, how do you know, mate? There's 42 Simplexes in this book alone. You find one that sounds like the front for a con operation, I'll buy it. Uh, Let's see. Simplex Cleaners? Nope, no. Nope. Simplex Associates? Uh, nope. What's uh, that? Nothing, nothing suspicious. Simplex Associates. Business opportunities, investments, gold, oil, and mining securities, marked cards, loaded dice, and Las Vegas real estate, nothing. Well, that just sounds like it might be a possibility, though. Yeah, real estate, it sounds... Missing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Mr. Dundee. Uh, Sam Dundee, do me a favor, will you, pal? What? Run across the hall and check the bunco files. There's an outfit called Simplex Associates. Well, what's it about? Well, it started out as a con game. A grifter took my client for a thousand bucks on the Spanish prisoner. Spanish prisoner? Yeah. Well, what's that got to do with me? Call bunco yourself, Sam. They're closed down at this time of night, Dundee. Be a sweetheart I'm now, I'm no will you? sweetheart. I'm a homicide lieutenant, and I don't run a service agency for private detectives. Uh-huh. Unless there's a corpse in it, you can take your business elsewhere. Dundee, look. Hold it, will you? I can't hold it. i got to get it. Oh, Vita, where is she? Where is my... Uh, I got her. Well, down on the floor. The couch at the back. No, 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 don't move. Easy there. That's it. Lovita, I know she's here. They must free her. You must call the police and... Free her? Why, why was Pedro holding her? To make me do this thing, this terrible thing. And I have done it. But you must stop him now. If he will let my Lolita go now, then you must stop him. Millions, millions of pesos in my honor. You must, you must. Where is he? Simplex. Sim... Oh, he's in a bad way, mate. Not anymore. He was an aristocrat, thin face, silver hair, and the look of a bourbon. It stopped me, Marjorie, because here it was, just like your Senor Palmera told you. The nobleman in the ragged clothes and dangling from one of his ankles the broken chain of a leg iron. In short, the complete Spanish prisoner. Dundee, it's legitimate now. You've got your corpse. There was nothing on him to indicate who he was or where he came from, but I had a feeling I'd seen him before. After making the lighthouse keeper promise me he'd lay off the pinball game until Dundee arrived, I took off from my office on a very practical errand. Buckling on my 45, sweetheart. If I had a light tank and a bazooka, I'd take them, too. Oh, Sam, your face I know, off. I know, sweetheart. Oh, Sam. Hmm? About the Spanish prisoner? Well, there's a real Spanish prisoner in this one, F. He's dead now, by the way, and from the cheap grift of a thousand bucks from a poor retired school teacher. We're now up in the million-dollar bracket. They got a murderous ex corine playing like she's been kidnapped and writing extortion notes to her grandpa, and a mug who looks like a monkey's nightmare, and nut picks and metal shavings and... Some place or somebody named Simplex, not to mention... Oh, Sam, Sam, oh. stop it. It's all my fault. I was so mixed up with the Argyles. What have the Argyles got to do with oh, it? When you called about the file, the circular on the confidence man... Yeah? I was looking under Carl under the seas, but I got out the one next to it by mistake. No. Yes. The one marked counterfeiters. <laughs> Only then did I remember where I'd seen the old man before. The paper was still on my desk, and his picture was still on the front page over an article that ran something like this. Search on for ex-Spanish Treasury official. Police today were still without definite leads in the search for Raymond Montoya, former chief engraver of the Spanish Mint. Montoya, who arrived in San Francisco three weeks ago to visit his granddaughter, vanished from his hotel room shortly after checking in, etc., etc., etc. Call Lieutenant Dundee at the lighthouse on the Embarcadero. Also call the Treasury Department. Tell them both Pedro Rodriguez and his two assistants are even now busily running off currency from place engraved by Raymond Montoya at the Simplex Printing Company, 509 Sansom Street. Yes, sir. Mexican pesos it was, by the basketful. 
and the treasury dicks agreed it was a happy thing for Mexico that Raymond had kept his engraver's tool on the right side of the law up to now. As to the matter of your Senor Palmera and his Spanish prisoner, I had excusably, I hope, lost my enthusiasm. And so it was, Marjorie, that I walked into the Palace Hotel lobby a couple of hours later to call you. Yes, sir? I'd uh, like some nickels to phone, please. Why, sir. Huh? Uh, shall I? No, 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 no. They're phony Mexican bills. Oh, dear. Dear me, oh. Oh, good heavens, you shouldn't show money around like that. I just stuck them in my pockets for evidence. Forgot to turn them over to the treasury. Ah, here we are. Here, the dime. Yes, sir. And here you are. Yep. Hey, senor, you dropped some big money. Ah, keep it, keep it. Huh? Yeah. Put these back in my pocket. Excuse me, please, senor. Hey, John, look, I want to talk on you. Hello? Marjorie, this is Sam Spade. Look, senor, I got to talk to you. Oh, Mr. Spade, did you find him? I'm sorry, Marjorie. I beg your pardon, senor. And just a minute, Marge. Look, buddy, you can have the phone in a minute. Now, will you relax? You mean my money is gone? I'm afraid so, Marge. It's an expensive lesson, but it's worth it if you remember, honey. From now on, never flash your money in public places. Senor, please. I'm almost through. Will you wait a minute? And never trust strangers, Marge. The world is full of sharks looking around for easy... Uh, Middle-aged ladies with bankrolls. But he seems so honest, Mr. Spade. That's the trouble. The way he came up to me and said, Senorita, I come to you on a matter of terrible urgency. I know, I know. He saw your bankroll and he come figured... to you on a matter of terrible urgency. Figured you look like an easy mark, Marge, so... Senor? Just a minute, Marjorie. What did you say? I say I come to you on a matter of terrible urgency. My uncle, Don Luis Alvarado, he's in awful trouble. Oh? Oh, there's going to be great rewards, senor, if you help us. You know, we just might be able to work something out. Well, Marjorie, he had $1,358, from which I deducted your thousand and closed herewith, plus $58 representing my standard retainer. Period. End of report. Oh, it must be awful to be gullible like that. Dear, sweet little soul. Yes. Imagine her falling for a transparent swindle like that. Now, that's one thing I've learned from you, Sam. Oh? I have my savings in a in a real good, solid thing. Uh, what's that? An avocado mine. An avocado mine? Where? In Nome. That's in Alaska, you know. Mm hmm. Well, nevertheless, and notwithstanding, go type that up. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. For something new about the Army, hear the Phil Regan Show every Sunday on NBC. Coming from a different service base every week, Phil Regan brings you songs and fun and brings prizes to talented GIs. It's an exciting newcomer in your Sunday chime lineup on NBC. And Sunday also means Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. <laughs> Sam. Why, Sam. A knit two, pearl three, slip one, and knit one, you see. How many rows did you do? I'm on 57. Are you sure you're right, Sam? Well, look at it. Have you ever seen such argyle? Well, that's what I mean, Sam. They, they, um, they sort of billow out, don't they? Well, who cares? That guy you're making them for probably won't appreciate them anyway. But they have to fit, Sam. Well, look at that. It'll make a perfect sleeping bag for a fat cat. I'm telling your boss lost them up. But, Sam... Oh, dear. What's the matter? Well, it was going to be a surprise. Therefore, um... <laughs> no. Yes? Well, I'll treasure them, sweetheart. They're the beautiful. Just what I wanted. That's my boss. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Also in the cast were Verna Felton, Lou Merrill, Shirley Mitchell, Ed Max, Jerry Hausner, Nestor Piva, and Tony Barrett. Script for tonight's adventures by Harold Swanton. 
Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. For more mystery excitement tomorrow, it's The Man Called X on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sweetheart. Oh. Well, that's a warm reception if I ever heard one. I'm here at my post, Sam, ready to do my duty. All right, all right, let's have it. Have what? What have I done? Well. Come on, come on. Sam, who was that lady I seen you with? What lady? What lady? Sam, for your information, there was a five-column picture on page one of the Chronicle showing you with your arms around The redhead? Yes. Ah. It means nothing to me as a person, Sam, although I am a redhead myself. But I feel there are certain standards of publicity and, and agency of our stature. So... Angel, Angel, if you'd bothered to read the caption under the picture, you would have learned that my arms were around this other redhead to keep her from braining me with a paperweight she picked off Dundee's desk. Oh. Yes. So take my picture back out of the drawer, and while you're at it, grab the book and pencil. Because I'll be right down with a somewhat lengthier explanation entitled... The Sinister Siren Caper. Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, a red-headed woman made a fool out of me. Effie! Miss Perrine! Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. I was just... Why, Sam! Mm. What a pleasant surprise. Oh? No black eyes. Uh, what? Hair comb, suit, breath. Yes, frayed, frayed, but tidy. How do you explain this, Sam? Well... I'm so used to you coming in with... <laughs> Battle scars? Uh-huh. Among other things. How do I explain this? That woman is a cue if I ever heard one. Are you, uh... Ready, Sam. That's all right. That's my girl. To Mr. Donald Stryker, Bellhaven Apartments from Samuel Spade. License number 137596. Subject, the sinister siren caper. Dear Donald. Business was terrible and I blamed the weather. Sitting in my office with my feet on the radiator and the paper on my lap, looking out on the 48th consecutive day of rain... I was seriously contemplating moving my place of business to a warmer clime where people could get out in the sunshine and into trouble. The only item of possible interest in the paper was the story of the escape of one Artie the Actor, a convicted bank robber who apparently didn't much care whether or not it was raining when he busted out of the city jail. I had reached the part about some good friend and true smuggling Artie a set of keys when something prompted me to look up. And that, Mr. Stryker, is how I found you. Mr. Spade? Yes, sir? I am Donald O. Stryker. Mm -hmm. S-T-R-Y-K-E-R. Uh, the O stands for Oglethorpe, my mother's maiden name. Oh, well, that's nice. Sit down, Mr. Stryker. Uh, thanks. Ooh. Well, now what can I do for you? <sighs> Mr. Spade, the Strikers, as you may or may not know, are an ancient and honorable family dating back to pre-Elizabeth England... No. With the possible exception of one southern number who is said to have once nodded by mistake to Jesse James. Mm -hmm. No striker has run afoul of the law. Well, good for you. One and all, we have kept our skirts clean. One and all. Mm. That is why I am utterly at a loss to explain the situation in which I find myself. And uh, just what situation is that? A quasi-reliable source has informed me that I am a marked man. Quasi? Yes. Hmm. Uh... Why don't you begin at the beginning, Mr. Stryker? The beginning, Mr. Spade, is only two minutes from the ending. Oh? Yes, it happened last night. I was sitting home with a book of Plato's dialogues when the bell rang most energetically. Mm -hmm. It proved to be a man named Strutt. George P. Strutt. S-T-R-U-T-T. -T. 
two tears. A wild-haired, wild-eyed individual he was, Mr. Spade. Yes. Stryker, he says. Donald O. Stryker. Hmm? Well, I'd hardly nodded when he grabbed me by the necktie. Ha! He said, just like that. Ha! Ha! Mm -hmm. Mr. Stryker, ha! I'm in time, then. You can still save yourself. And he shoved this at me. Oh, what's that? A picture of a girl, a young and rather pretty girl, out from a newspaper. Oh, yeah. No name or identification. Beware this girl, Stryker, he said. Beware the siren song she sings. Stryker, he said, and he stitched up even harder on my necktie. Yes? Stryker, you are number six. I am five and four are doomed before us. Beware, Stryker, beware this girl, this sinister red-haired harpy, this handmaiden of the dark angel. Well, that's quite a speech. A curtain speech, Mr. Spade. Mm. For with that, he let go my necktie and ran off down the hall. Somehow, somehow after that, Plato didn't seem quite the same. Yes, I see what you mean. Uh, do you know this girl? Never saw her before in my life. Or strut either? No. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Mr. Stryker, I don't want to talk myself out of a job, but you don't need a private detective. Now, this is probably some harmless chap who walked out of one of the local sanitariums and took to ringing doorbell. But that's just it. He isn't, Mr. Spade. Huh? I did some telephoning this morning. Yes? He has a quasi-successful cigar stand downtown and an apartment on Leavenworth Street. His name is right next to mine in the telephone book. I... I, I must get to the bottom of this, Mr. Spade. I... I... Here. Here's fifty dollars. Well, Mr. Stryker, are you completely skeptical? No. No. Just quasi. And with that, we formalized our agreement on one of my quasi-legal contracts, and I promised to call you instantly if anything turned up and you departed, still in a quasi-quandary. Sticking the newspaper clipping into my wallet, I hopped a cab and went to Strutt's apartment on Leavenworth. Let's see, 26... Four, twenty-two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hoo hoo! Hey! Hey, lady! Hmm. Yeah, open. It was a cleaning lady, cloth on head, mop and tail beside her, testing the guarantee on Strutt's grand piano. Ah. Got no respect for a thousand dollar grand piano. Listen to that. Busted string. Yes. It's a crime, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. What do you want, Jack? I uh, take it Mr. Strutt isn't in. Nope. Who are you? Sam Spade, private detective. Detective? Yeah. Seems Strutt thinks someone is going to kill him. <laughs> oh, no. When did he dream that one up? <laughs> you got me. You know him very well? I've come here twice a week for 15 years. Oh. You want to talk, Sam? You'll have to follow me around. Okay. Got to get a wiggle on. Come on, now. I'll get a wiggle on. You think uh, you think he was dreaming it up, huh? Now, let me tell you about George Strutt. Yes. Yep. Let me put that bucket down. Oh, please. Oh, there. I'm sorry. He is 68 years old, to my knowledge. And in them 68 years, one important thing has happened to him. He was born. Oh. George just reads too many cheap books, that's all. Well, no girlfriends? No. Well, no, wait a minute. Let me see. There was a woman about eight years ago in the bird watching club he belongs to, but uh, that laid an egg. Bird watching. Any enemies? How could a man like George have enemies? Nobody notices him. He matches the rug. Mm -hmm. Now, look. He goes to lodge meetings twice a month, to church every Sunday. He doesn't smoke. Drink, gamble, spill on the floor, or chase women. Mm -hmm. Got no other bad habits. No car, no house, no money, no prospects. Yeah. Look out, I gotta get into that closet. Oh, yes, yeah. So why would anyone want to kill George Strutt? He's been dead on his feet for twenty years. Why, when I see George, I'll give him a piece of my <gasps> George! Oh, <laughs> I turned in time to see him lean out stiffly, pause like a falling tree, and then topple to the floor. Followed closely by the cleaning lady, who must have agreed before she fainted that George didn't match the rug anymore. While this struck a false note in my mind, it explained the false note in the piano. 
the missing string was wound around his neck. I dragged her into the bedroom and managed to get her onto the bed by making two trips. Then I called homicide. The next order of business, per our agreement, was to call you, Stryker. So I got Strutt's telephone book, found he'd marked the page with your number on it, with a slip of paper, which turned out to be the receipt for rent paid on a safe deposit box at the Golden Gate Bank. Now, this didn't seem especially important at the moment, but something else did. He made a circle around a group of six names in the phone book, marking each one with a check. Strubble, Strudwick, Strum, Strutterton, Strutt, and Stryker. I postponed calling you for the moment and dialed the number just above Strutt's. Strutterton, Harvey J., 156 Santa Ana Avenue, St. Francis Wood. Yes? Mr. Strutterton in, please. No. Uh, no, M- Mr. Strutterton isn't in. This is his wife. Ma- ma- uh, my name is Spade, Mrs. Strutterton. I'm a private detective. I, uh, I don't want to alarm you, but... Alarm me? Uh, do you happen to know if your husband has received any threats recently? Why, not that I know of. Any contact with a strange young woman, about 30, red hair? Why are you asking me this? Well, I'd rather not say until I know more about it. What about the girl? Yes. Yes, he, he did meet a girl like that. Oh, when? She, uh... She came to the door one night about a week ago. She said her car was stalled down the street a ways. Harvey went out to help her. They were gone about a half hour, and then he came back. Well, did he tell you anything about it? No. Just that he'd gotten her started. Uh-huh. Is he a mechanic, or...? He was a lawyer. Was? Harvey's dead, Mr. Spade. His car crashed through a rail on the Skyline Boulevard night before last. Burned. I've just been to San Mateo to identify the body. Uh, Strom Joseph P., 828 Howard Street. Yeah, yeah, that's Joe. That is your beer. Thanks. You know Joe pretty well? I might, and I might not. Why? What do you mean you might not? This is 828 Howard Street, isn't it? The number's over the door. Don't you like me, bartender? What's eating you about, Joe Strum? Look, you see this? Mm, private detective's life. Huh? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Poor but honest, Barky. Trying hard to get a little cooperation. I thought you was a cop. Uh, what's with Joe? Well, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, uh, he uses the phone here. He makes a little book now and then in the back room. Nothing wrong, you understand, but still and all, there's nothing a guy likes to blat around about the strangers, you know. Yeah. Any idea where he is now? Well, that's a pretty hard thing to say where Joe is at any given time. Oh. Even when Joe's acting normal, which at present he isn't. Oh, why not? Well, like all bookies, Joe does not have a heart. But if he had one, I would not hesitate to say Joe was in love. With a red-headed dame about 30. How did you know? There, look at the picture. Uh, uh, let me get my glasses. Uh, well. Glasses, glasses, glasses. Yeah. There they are. Uh-huh. 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 This is the dish. Mm. You uh, know her name? No, no. Joe has made no formal announcement as yet, but the way has gone around, he is giving eight to five, he will marry her. Which for Joe is a sure thing. Mm. Uh, last Friday it was when I seen him last. They sat up to the bar here, and the two of them talking at some length about things I had never heard Joe discuss before. Like what? Well, as I said, bookies are different from people, so it should have not surprised me that Joe and his wren were not discussing rose-covered cottages as do most boys and girls when they reach the loony stage. Yes. From what I could gather as I passed by now and again, serving the other customers, Joe and his girl were discussing a cozy little rose-covered safe deposit box. Mm-hmm. And you haven't seen either of them since last Friday, huh? No, I have Oh, i be right with you. Yeah. Cloverleaf Buffet, Charlie Tuggan. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? You don't say. When? This morning, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, I will. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Hey, you, uh... You wouldn't know a bookie who might be casting about for a phone, would you, pal? What happened to Joe? Body washed ashore on Baker's Beach this morning. That was the morgue. <laughs> I know what you mean, Sam. 
Marks, abrasions, contusions, indications of foul play. That's right, Maxine. Did you see the police surgeon's report? Yeah. Shot a dope and shoved into the briny. Person or persons unknown. Well, pretty hard to do by yourself, huh, Sam? Yeah. Oh, you wish to look on Joe Strom, I take it. Yeah, yeah, this it. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, no, this is the wrong one. This is Strudwick. Wait a minute, Strudwick. Strudwick. Anthony P. Are you known, Sam? Yeah. 28 Genoa Place, Bayview 72118. Nice looking boy, they said. Mm. Friend of yours, huh? No, no. Huh? Well, then how did you... Brand new league I'm in, Maxie. We call the shots ahead of time. Now, what about Strudwick? Old artist. Lived on Telegraph Hill. Got drunk three nights ago. Walked out his studio window on the fourth floor. All alone at the time. Well, if anyone offers you odds on that, grab it. See you later, Maxie. Yeah, hey, but ain't you going to look on Joe Strom? No. Well, it's up to you, Sam. So long, Strudwick. Top man on the totem pole was James A. Struble, a barber who lived on 18th Avenue. I called, no one answered. So I made what by now had become the obvious deduction. I went to headquarters and checked the homicide reports, likewise the accident files and the traffic details. Surprise! No James A. Struble. So I switched abruptly from the S's to the D's and called on dear, patient, understanding Lieutenant Dundee. Who's going off half car? You. If you weren't such an idiot, you'd see what I'm talking about. No, listen, Sam, I'm no green pea. I've been kicking around homicide for 30 years. Long enough to know you got to have a motive to build up a case. Yes. How can you stand there and tell me a red-headed dame opens a phone book, draws a ring around six names, and then runs out quick and knocks them off? I didn't say that. Ah. Uh-huh. Then why do you want me to put out a general pickup on James A. Struble? Because if he isn't dead right now, he will be. Oh. Uh, the dame? Dundee, no dame could strangle a six-foot man like Strutt with a piano wire. She's working with someone. Sam, I love you, believe me, but try to see my side, will you? So I put out a general on Struble, and we pick him up, and he screams. And the chief hauls me in to ask why. And I tell him we put the pinch on Struble because his name is ticked off in somebody's phone book. Why? Huh? Hey, who are you? Lieutenant. I want to see the lieutenant. Hey, is he drunk? I'll ask him. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what's your name? Struble. James A. Struble. I want to report a murder. Or who? Me. That's the last we got out of him. Ten seconds after he hit the floor, he was dead. A thirty-eight slug had taken him just under the left shoulder blade, and instinctively, Dundee grasped the point. A squad car was dispatched to your office, Mr. Stryker, to pick you up and stow you safely in the poke when I checked out. <laughs> listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and very unpredictable Tallulah brings you another gala broadcast of the big show. Among Tallulah's guests for this Sunday's big show are Fred Allen, Eddie Cantor, Phil Baker, Eddie Fisher, and many, many more. It's an hour and a half of the very best in comedy, music, and drama. Every Sunday, it's the big show on NBC. For drama this Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents the heartwarming play Genie, starring Barry Sullivan and Margaret Phillips. <laughs> To the sinister siren caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The next move looked like a tedious one to take the clipped out picture of the redhead and try to identify her by matching it up in the files of one of the town's four newspapers. I'd gone a half a block when someone saved me the trouble. It was the bartender. I got news for you. Uh, where can we talk? How about the blue fox? Okay, I'll meet you there in five minutes. Wait a minute. Why can't we talk here? Cheers. Yeah. <coughs> sorry, Sam, sorry. Well, you're in hmm? sad shape, bartender. What happened? The redhead. Hmm? Joe Strom's girl. 
She was in. When? An hour ago. She was loaded to begin with. And when I poured her a couple of stiff horns on the house, she begun to talk. Oh? Sam, crime is rampant. Yeah? For instance? Well, from what she told me, Joe Strum was dwelling in a fool's paradise. Yeah. Much talk, many promises, and an occasional smooch. But when the score is added up, Joe never gets past his own ten-yard line. Whose girl was she? Whose girl? <clears throat> Prepare for a jolt, Sam. I'm holding onto my chair. Adi the actor. Adi the actor? Adi the actor. The picture you showed me was taken at his trial. Oh. She was sitting right behind his lawyer. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The safe deposit box. Yeah? How much is Adi supposed to have stashed away? She told me. A solid half million bucks. Now, numerous insurance officials and a hat full of private dicks are openly curious as to what happened to the dough. Yeah. And the ranks of the curious have just been joined by Adi himself since he busted out of the jug. No dough? The cupboard is bare. Mm. Why did he take the box out in Joe's name? She says Adi's a whimsical type guy. Whimsical. You know what he does? What? He flips the phone book open when they pull into town with the dough and picks himself five names and five banks. Six names, you mean? No, nope. five, she says. Well, oh, Stryker was in. Huh? Never mind, never mind. So Adi figured with the money in five different legitimate names, it couldn't be traced to him if, it, if he got tapped, huh? Which he does get. Tapped and convicted besides. Mm. Now, the dish looks upon Adi as in the deep freeze and hustles around to each of the five guys with a proposition. So? Adi becomes wise to this and takes them up in order when he busts out. Mm. Uh, cheers. Yeah. <laughs> this much, this much I learned before she staggers out of my joint. Mm. The rest I must leave for you to think. <laughs> you uh, can't drink, bartender. Occasional. Mm. Uh, Sam. If there is any other reward, though, floating around when the smoke settles, I will be at the Cloverleaf. It's uh, only beer, you know. And if you run across an honest, hard-working book who needs a phone... Yeah, thanks a lot, Charlie. So long, <laughs> Charlie wiped the froth off his chin with a napkin and took off. I let him have a healthy lead, then tailed him. It was quite a tour, too, into the morgue, across the street, out the Kearney Street door, then onto the California Street cable car, and up Knob Hill to the Fairmont Hotel, where he hustled into a yellow cab number 462 and drove off. And, waiting for him in the cab, was the red-headed dame. There were no other cabs around to follow him, so I waited a half hour until he got back, waved a bill under the driver's nose, and climbed back on the merry-go-round. He let Charlie out at his own place, the Cloverleaf, and then driven downtown to a flea bag called the Shoreside Hotel... On the Embarcadero, where he left the redhead. I woke up the desk clerk and shoved the redhead's picture under his nose. Uh, let me see, let me see. Uh, seems like... You recognize him? Sure. Clara Bow. Clara Bow, the movie queen, ain't it? <laughs> Don't win anything. Look, friend, she was just here. Clara? The girl here. Oh, isn't she ain't Clara Bow? Right, right, she ain't Clara. She just drove up in a taxi, and... Mm, don't see her as good as I used to. You, you, you see, the glasses hurt my nose. Look, she just drove up in a taxi. Did you see her come in? No, no, no. I I must have been dozing away. Yeah, yeah. I seen her come out, though. Huh? Yeah. Her and Mr. Walker checked out 15 minutes back. He was in 26 upstairs. <laughs> I didn't have to cross-examine the clerk to see Mr. Walker had lived in 26 for some time. The floor was ankle-deep in cigarette butts, liquor bottles, sandwich crusts, and other debris. A table in the corner was covered with travel folders, mostly on South America. And seven days' newspapers, the top one of which was turned to the story on Artie the Actor that I've been reading in my office this morning when it all started. You know, it's too bad you came in when you did, Stryker, because if I'd read one more paragraph, I'd have learned something that could have saved me a lot of trouble. Whatever was the case with four of the names, the fifth one, Artie hadn't picked at random. His lawyer was Harvey J. Strutherton. Hello? Mrs. Strutherton, this is Sam Spade. Oh, Mr. Spade. Yeah. Thank heaven you called. I'm terribly frightened. What's the matter? The girl. The red hen? Yes, yeah, she just called me. She says, she says my husband was murdered. One of his clients, a man he defended, thinks Harvey betrayed him. Artie the actor. Artie Billings. Yes. Yeah. There was a lot of money. She knows where it is. Why is she telling you all this? I don't know, Mr. Spade. She warned me against calling the police. I don't know what to do. Well, then don't do anything. Well, don't you see? She's coming here. She'll be here in 20 minutes. I made it in 15. Left the cab a block away and walked down Santa Ana Avenue to number 156. 
The night fog had moved in, making it tough to follow the path through the high shrubbery to the door of the house. Mrs. Strutterton hadn't helped matters any by turning out every light in the joint. Spade? Yeah, yeah, she hear you? No, no, come in, come in. Why'd you turn out the lights? I was being watched. There's a fire in the living room, this way. The shades and draperies were all pulled. The windows shut tight. The house had the musty reek of a room that's been closed up for a long time. She guided me around the dining room furniture and through the doors into the living room, sat me down in front of the fire. Would you like some brandy, Mr. Spade? No, thanks. Cigarette? Yeah. Thanks. Tell me now. Tell me, I want to know everything. This man my husband defended. You know he's out of jail? I saw the papers. Why would he kill Harvey? After my husband did everything in his power to get him acquitted. Money. A lot of money. How much? A half million dollars. Oh. How about a match? Oh, yes, of course. I held back, and without thinking, she leaned over into the firelight. I saw Mrs. Strutterman then for the first time. It was the redhead. <laughs> All right, hold it. Now, don't move. What are you this doing? is a thirty-eight baby at the back of your neck. Now, don't move. All right, where is he? I don't know what you mean. You heard what I said. Where's your husband? He's dead. He's the dead. The body you identified in San Mateo is already the actor. You and Harvey engineered the escape so you'd have a fall guy for five murders and 500,000 bucks. Now, for the last time, where is he? Harvey. All right. Harvey, you'll kill me. <laughs> don't spare, Don't. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I didn't have to. A few months hence, the state of California will do it the legal way. It was a long ride round Robin Hood's barn striker, but you wanted to get to the bottom of it, so there it is. Period. End of report. Well, Sam, what about the money? They're still looking for it, If Harvey has thus far chosen not to talk, but Dundee hasn't really turned on the persuasion machinery yet. Who knows? Maybe he's opened the phone book at the P's and put his finger on Perrine, Effie. Oh, don't even think of it, Sam. Uh -huh. I'll settle for $26.87, which represents the shortage in my check covering the period... Effie! What, 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 Sam? Can I believe my ears? What? I look back upon the past 12 hours. How to keep our little organization together, to stave off the bill collector. Oh, Sam. I, I place my life in jeopardy, tangled with a murderess, use my poor, tired body as bait for her savage conspiracy. Sam. Ferreting my way through morgue and crime-ridden alley to finally win the fight and then... And then to come home expecting a cheery welcome and to get instead scurvy innuendos and a bill for twenty six eighty seven. Don't forget it, Sam. Don't ever mention it again. I'm sorry. Well, that's my girl. Here. Ten, twenty, five, six, seven. Twenty-seven dollars. Now we're all square. Thanks, Sam. Thank now, you. come here. <laughs> Now you can bring me the 13 cents tomorrow. That's my boss. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Uh, this is Miss Bergamot. Oh, Miss Bergamot, I'm so sorry. Oh, but Mr. Spade isn't in. He ought to be back any moment, however. Uh, that is, if you wish to employ him. <laughs> this is his secretary, Miss Perrine. Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Perrine. Oh, he'll be available, I know. The matter he's attending to is, uh, it's just, it's purely routine. What he calls a, a humdrum number. Humdrum? Well, it's a private detective version of babysitting. You see, all Mr. Spade had to do was sit on a chair for 24 hours. And that's why I say he'll be back any minute. His last words to me were, take anything. So if you desire a I did sure. not desire Mr. Spade's services. As a matter of fact, he's using mine. What? I'm his nurse at the Harbor Emergency Hospital. <gasps> nurse, another shot. Please, this time, bourbon. You must oh. quietly, Mr. Spade. Oh. Uh, he's coming along quite nicely. Oh. The bullet didn't enter the cranium at all. Bullet? Cranium? So. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Spade wants to... But I uh, refuse, Spade, nurse. Have... I refuse. But, Miss Nightingale, I am. F, F, Wonder Girl. Sam. Uh, oh, Sam. Dry those big brown eyes, Sheriff. Flap up the sofa and spread out some lamp for me to lay my poor bullet-ridden head on. In practically no time at all, I'll, I'll be staggering in to gasp out a humdrum report on the Kimberly Cross caper. <laughs> Thank you.
For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Hospitals, milk. I have to break down your whole constitution, give you fits. Ah. Hey, Sam. Who else? Oh. Hmm. You look like the drummer man in the spirit of 76. Nothing, nothing, nothing. As you know, Angel, no profession is without its hazards, least of all this tawdry one of ours. Now, sit down now. Oh, uh, yes, Sam. Now, may I put my poor wounded head in your lap? Oh. Uh, comfy? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, poor Sam. Uh, they're stupid, too, honey. Let's see now. Hey, new feeling. I, too, huh? Uh, uh, date, fill it in to, uh, G.J. Runcible, claims manager, Sunset Indemnity Company, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Kimberly Cross Caper. Dear Mr. Runcible. It's just as well for private investigators that we have no way of knowing, by the way a job starts, how it's going to end. I remember once I went beating the bushes for a mad dog killer and ended up playing Monopoly with him in a hotel room for six hours. And I remember, too, the time I agreed to take a box of homemade candy to an old lady, wound up with a double murder and a case of arson. Yours, Mr. Runcible, belong to this species. Spade. G.J. Runcible, Sunset Indemnity. You available? Maybe. What would you have? Are you or are you not available, Mr. Spade? Answer yes or no? Yes. Yes. How much? Fifty a day. Yeah. Expenses, yes. right. Right. Got a job for you next 24 hours. All you got to do is sit on a chair and keep your eyes on something beautiful. Sounds keen. Might call it a babysitting job. Oh, uh-huh. who is she? Kimberly Cross. Pretty? Like a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, rich, too, huh? She's on exhibit at the Bergendorf Galleries on Sutter Street. She's on exhibit. Get over there right away. Well, I'd better. Check with Mr. Bergendorf personally and then see Johnny Stroud, our company man. He'll give you instructions. Fine. Now, now, why don't you tell me what we're... Hello? Hello? Uh, always happens on page six. <laughs> Mr. Bergendorf! Mr. Bergendorf, you! Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sir. The exhibit officially does not until 9 a.m. begin. As you see... It's 8.45. I won't charge you, Mr. Bergendorf. I won't charge you. You can bring out the baby any time now. Mr. Runcible of the Sunset Indemnity sent me here my credentials. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mr. Spade, you are? Uh, Mr. Spade, I am. Yes. Now, uh, what's with this Kimberly Cross? Uh, to a single horse gallery such as mine comes such an honor only one. Yes. Uh, today only, Bergendorf's is with Tiffany's in the same class. Hmm? Here. Uh, here. Huh? A picture of Kimberly Cross. Yeah? Fourteen stones, all blue-white. Eight down, six across. Total, $268,000 plus 20% tax. Oh, jewelry. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, To call this jewelry is to call Elizabeth Taylor a garden variety tomato. Yeah. It's a crown jewel from Turingia, Mr. Spade. Really? It's part of a state of a dead duke. It's price tag $268,000 plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where is it? In vault. Time lock. Comes nine o'clock on the nose, she opens. Then... Yeah, the exhibit begins. Yeah, there's a company man here from the insurance outfit, isn't there? Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, Johnny Stroud. Oh, where is he? He's working concealed. Oh? Uh, this man Stroud undercover. Clever stuff, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, you see, uh, parked at curb across the street, one autobus. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, Department of Public Health, City and County of San Francisco. What, the uh... Anti-tuberculosis campaign. Pardon? Is uh, giving to public for free gratis one X-ray per citizen for chest cavity. Oh, chest X-ray. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, handily parking opposite the Bergendorf Gallery, so inside Mr. Stroud can take for himself a plan. Uh, get it? Clever. <laughs> Clever. The free gratis auto bus for chest X-rays was a square end job, complete with reception compartment, X-ray machine, and attendant. The latter a sincere type with horn-rimmed glasses and white starched blouse. I use the word sincere advisedly, since he was at the moment doing a selling job on Johnny Stroud. 
You know what I always say, Stroud? What do you always say, George? You never can tell about a call. You never, <coughs> never know. Yeah, you see? You see right there. I got a call. Maybe. Eight to five, it's only a call. But five to eight, no. Oh, let me take the picture now. No charge, no pain. No, no dice. Go away, go away. Oh, Spade? Yeah. Good, good. Come on in. Come on in. The boss said he was sending you up. Plenty of room back here. You realize you're standing right in front of my x-ray machine? Oh. We'll move when you get a customer. Oh, customers, Fine. yes. Where are they? Where are those chests? If people only knew that eight to five, it may be a cold. Then Did again, uh, never Runcible never brief you on this, Spade? Yeah, it was brief, all right. How do you make it? Fourteen vulgar-sized diamonds looking for a buyer. Sunset of damnity, ensuring Bergendorf against loss during the 24 hours they're on his hand. Ah, that's two for you. That's two against me, too. Oh? Why, why does Sunset indemnity need outside help when they have you? And why are you playing like a movie dick when the sensible thing to do is to sit down next to the exhibit with both eyes open and a rod under your arm? What are you doing, George? I'm testing my machine. Don't let me interfere with you, boy. <laughs> George doesn't like me. I see that. Well, I guess the boss left out one item, Sam. A tip? Yeah, yeah. Last night, some schmo called him around midnight and got him out of bed. Oh? Principal's a pessimist, you know. <laughs> when Sunset Indemnity's on the line for a quarter of a million, he tends to get jumpy. Who had the tip? Anonymous. They all are. Right from the oat bin, the guy says. Somebody's going to take a run and jump at the Kimberley Cross while it's at Bergendorf's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Needless to say, for the balance of the night, Principal does not sleep... So, today, we got reinforcements. <sighs> Georgie? Yes? I'm going to leave you now, George, to take my post across the street while Mr. Spade... Hey, wait a minute, Johnny. Hmm? Hmm? Look, look, in front of Bergendorf's. The dame? The dame. To paraphrase Bergendorf, calling her a dame was like calling the Kimberly Cross a hunk of jewelry. Now, that's not what interested me, at least... Not right then. She was walking back and forth in front of Bergendorf's like a kid at the dentist's door trying to get up the nerve to push the button. Quoting from my notes, it says, 9.02 a.m., girl, 5 feet 2, blonde, early 20s, gray tweed suit, spent a few indecisive minutes in front of Bergendorf's, finally went in. She came out almost immediately, started west on Sutter, then evidently saw a patrol officer approaching on same side of street. Hurriedly crossed toward our post in Public Health Department, Mobile Unit Number 2, and entered. Hello. Well, good morning, good morning. Uh, am I too early for the, um... Oh, you're just in time. First customer of the day. Yeah, let's see now. Name? Uh, uh Martin. Martin? First name? Bernice. Address? Uh, eight... She wasn't a very good liar. While she was telling him her name was Bernice Martin, she filled with a leather handbag with the initials P.C. on it, big enough to read from across the street. George filled the form out, then moved her around to the machine. By now, the cop she was ducking and walked by and turned the corner. Uh, shall I... No, no, it won't be necessary to take off your coat. Is this all right? That's good. Stand right there. Hold still now. Take a deep breath. Hold it. That's all there is to it. You're doing a wise thing, lady. You think so? Certainly. Eight to five, it's only a cold, but five to eight, you, you never, never know. Eh, here's your stub with your number on it. We'll notify you in a few days. Thank you. Thank you. Whereupon Miss P.C. also down to the corner and into a drugstore. Five minutes later, she still hadn't come out. Stroud was beginning to champ at the bit. So what, Sam? So she's worried. Ah. She's ducking cops. She's using a phony name. Or oh, her girlfriend's handbag. Look, I'm going. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sure I've seen her somewhere before. Where? I don't know, but I think it was around headquarters. Now who's playing movie, Dick? <laughs> Look, it's uh, ten after nine. I'll go over and settle down next to the vulgar diamonds, and you make yourself comfy with Georgie. If I get busy, out you go, Keep pal. Keep your eyes on the customers going in and out. There's a good loud burglar alarm over the door there. You can hear it the block away. You see what I mean? It's good and loud. Holy cow. Stroud took the gallery and I set sail for the corner drugstore, pulling up in 20 seconds flat. She was gone, of course. The druggist was at the fountain, mixing a coke, which he spilled when I reached across and grabbed him by the lapel. Blonde, you say? Yeah, yeah, young, gray suit. Hmm. I, I told you, Jack. She just came in here. I know. What do you want to know about her? What'd she do, telephone? Nope. She was just like you. Asked me about a guy. What guy? Larry Galliano, his name is. Wanted to know if I'd seen him come by this morning. Who's he? 
I don't know. Did she describe him? Didn't have to. His picture's on page one of the morning paper. Here, take a look. It was no time to dawdle, but I gave it ten seconds. Larry Galliano, a one-time gas station stick-up artist, had just been released from Quentin after doing five years. On the way across the street to Bergendorf's, it came back to me where I'd seen her, standing outside the courtroom, crying when they sentenced him five years ago. Over here, Sam. Yeah. Oh, no. Bergendorf, huh? Yeah. Yeah, shot from behind. The stones, needless to say... Sure. Maybe you were right about that day. No, no, she didn't have time. Someone was hiding in here waiting for Bergendorf to open up this morning. How'd he get out? Well, there must be a back door in this joint. I'll check it. The phone's on the desk. Wake up Lieutenant Dendy, huh? Right. How he'll love it, too. Two of us holding hands across the street while... Oh, 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 Stroud! Johnny Stroud! Look. Look, it's me, Bergendorf. Same spade. Stroud! He's checking the back door. Who did it? Oh, double cross. Double cross me. Once it is all. Who? Who are you talking about? It was as plain as a man in his condition could have made it. Obvious to anyone with average intelligence. But for stupid Sam, it was still a long voyage home. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective... Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music for you tomorrow on NBC with the distinctive four keyboard styling of the first piano quartet. This widely acclaimed and unique musical organization brings you a melodic blend of classical and light classical selections in four-part harmony every Saturday. And tomorrow, there's also a one-hour concert by the NBC Symphony Orchestra under the baton of Walter Duclos. Featured in tomorrow's symphony performance are works by Sibelius and Schumann. It's the best in music every Saturday with the NBC Symphony and the first piano quartet. And now back to the Kimberly Cross caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. It was a pretty selfish trick, but I left Johnny Stroud at the Bergendorf Gallery to play for Cheesy with Dundee and company, knowing in advance pretty much how the patter was going to run. Then called the Chronicle and found the picture of Larry Galliano had been taken yesterday as he walked out of a flea bag on Mission Street called the Aeolian Hotel. Yeah. Galliano? Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I know him. Stayed here the night before last. Until I found out about him. Oh, found out what? Yeah, that he was the next con there. Well. This here's a respectable joint uh, place, a house, mister. Uh-huh. We don't cater to felons, Mr. Miners, or any other members of the demon. Demon? Yes, indeed. Uh-huh. So when I found where Galliano come from, why... Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, look, did he give you a forwarding address? Let me see, son. Uh, mm. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Christopher Apartments on Jones. See. Hmm? See, you're in luck, young man. Yeah, my girlfriend's a landlady over there. Now, looky here. Don't you sweet talk her now. <laughs> boy, out of the way. Look, all I want, madam, is one moment of your time. I already told you, boy, I don't know no Galliano. Never heard of him. Pull up! I don't want to hear from him. Yeah, well, wait a minute now. Will you just take Not a look one at... One side, boy, one oh, side. One more, oh, more, right there. Sweet. I no time for Well, anything. Mrs. Landlady, I'm afraid you've lost out. What? Yeah, you were in line to wearing a bagless vacuum cleaner, you know. Oh, but wait, 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 wait a minute, Curly. Wait a hmm? minute. <laughs> what you want to know, bud? Yes. Well, uh, this Galliano just might be using another name. Now, this is his picture right here. Oh. Yes. Now, I will rephrase my question. Has he been around? Um, uh, uh, nope. I see, landlady. Well, 
Do I win? Oh, I am sorry, but stand by for the giant jackpot. Is it electric? I patted her cheek, made a detour around her, and left, figuring to check with the parole board. But as I was climbing into the cab in front of the building, a stray thought hit me, and I went back to the doorway and cased the nameplates again. This time for someone with the initials I'd remembered seeing on the blonde's handbag, P.C. I did better. Patricia Conroy was living in apartment 402. I buzzed four times, then tried the door. It was open. I gave the living room and bedroom a fast toss, moved on to the kitchen, and cased a hamper full of laundry on the back porch. Result, nil. I'd about decided I was in the wrong apartment when I noticed something that changed my mind. A crumpled up envelope in a waste paper basket in the living room with today's date on it, marked Western Airlines, Flight 6 to Los Angeles, passenger L.P. Galliano. I had the phone in one hand and a finger on the dial when... Put it down. Huh? Oh. oh. Are you going to put the phone down or do I have to shoot? You mean there's no third choice? Put it down. Sure. Now what? Sit down. You'll be here for a while. Huh? His plane lands at Burbank in a half hour. If you have any dates between now and 4.30, forget them. Mm-hmm. Mind if I smoke? Go ahead. Oh. You know, uh, this is pretty heavy-handed stuff for an eye, you know. I've grown up a lot in the last two days. Not enough, honey. Or she wouldn't be stooging for Galliano. He can't run away from this kind of a rat, you know. Forty-eight hours. Hmm? That's how long Larry's been out of the pen. Well, he didn't waste any time getting back in stride. Look, uh, what's your name? Spade. Spade, what if I told you Larry Galliano had nothing to do with it? I might give you quite an argument. And I don't feel like arguing, mm-hmm. so I'll just tell you. Good. Someone offered him the job at Bergendorf's the day he got out. Larry thought it was legitimate until he... Heard a couple of things by accident. Like what? Like getting hired to play fall guy in a phony robbery. You mean Bergendorf was in? Sure. Till this morning. Uh-huh. They figured Larry would be a handy guy to have hanging around with his big, fat prison record when the diamonds disappeared. That's what he told me, and I believe him. I love him. Whether or not you believe or love me or him, I do not care. I also do not care what kind of a rap you pin on me when this is all over. All I want is time, enough to do a couple of errands. Now, hoist it out of that chair and put it down in the closet there. You hear what I said? Yes, ma'am. I was wrong. She was no ingenue. Happily, the closet had a light in it, so I settled down on a hat box and read some old copies of Mademoiselle until 5.30 when I heard the door close. What with soundproof outside walls, no window, a double slab door with a lock she thoughtfully filled with gum, was almost seven when I got back to my office. The next move, of course, was to call Lieutenant Dundee and wise up the Los Angeles police on Galliano. I picked up the phone and put it down four times. There was no use kidding myself. The yarn she told was pretty wild, but there was something about the way she told it. And I believed her. Spade. In here. Spade. Yeah. You remember me this morning, hmm? oh, George, yeah. the technician from the X-ray mobile unit? Yeah, George. What's on your mind? Uh, funny thing. That girl, 34 chest, you remember the blonde? Oh, yeah. I remember her very well, George. What about the blonde? Well, I, I tried to call her. Operator says there's no such number, and the company has no record of a Bernice. She was using a phony moniker, George. Her name's Patricia Conroy. Oh, now why would she do that? Well, a girl's got to be careful, you know. She does, for sure. How come? How come? I, 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 I kind of took an interest in her case, you know. I, I rushed the pictures through as soon as we closed up tonight. She's an incipient case. Oh? Huh? Yes. I wanted to wise her up right away. You see, here. Here. Oh. <laughs> this is... Uh, no, no. This one's Johnny Stroud. I took huh? it when he wasn't looking. Huh? Told him I was testing. He was right at that. Nothing wrong with him. Huh? But I always say you never, never... Yeah, 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 yeah. How about the girl? How about, how about the girl? Cold. Oh, hmm. yes, yes. Yes. Here now, now, look. You, you, you see this shadowy part here? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. I wasn't looking at the shadow part. I was looking at something at the left side of the picture, right where the inside coat pocket would be. The clear black outline of the Kimberly Cross. Do you mean she had the... Thing? Yeah, yeah, give me the phone. 
Well, I thought it was one of those clip gimmicks the girls wear on the... The phone, the phone. Spade? Johnny Stroud. Look, I got news for you. I got news for you, too. I spotted that blonde again. Where? In a bar on Connie Street. Talking to guess who? You mean Galliano? Who's he? Never mind, never mind. Who was she drinking with? Papadopoulos. The biggest jewelry fence on the coast. Where are you now? Outside her apartment. Jones is near post. I think the numbers... I'll uh... be up in five minutes. Look, like I told you, Spade, I don't want to argue. She says she doesn't want to argue, Sam. Too bad, too bad. I, uh, I don't mind telling you I'm a little burned up, baby. I fell for that line you handed me this afternoon. I, I didn't even mind sitting in your closet for two hours. Ah, uh, what's that? Sure, she's got a thirty-two tucked away here somewhere. Had me looking up the barrel while she dished out Shut a lot of... Who's got the cross, honey? You or Galliano? We don't know anything about it. Then what were you doing in that bar with Papadopoulos? Larry said whoever had it would try to move it through him. I thought I could get to him, but I was wrong. How did that sound? What do you think? Look... I walked into Bergendorf's this morning. Why'd you run out? The vault was open. Furniture was overturned. Bergendorf didn't answer when I called. I figured it was a setup for Larry to check in. He was on his way, so... so... It does sound phony. It sure does, honey. I, I have a lie, I guess. I could make up a better story than that. Oh, you're doing great. Why'd Larry blow Tom? You need a diagram? He was scared. What chance is an ex-convict when it's his story against someone else's? What did you do with the thirty-two? In the drawer. Who did? Now, here's the big question, honey. I can't tell you anything else. Where are the diamonds? How do I know? How do I know? Look, you're a real modest girl, Patricia. As a liar, you're sensational. I'm not lying. Oh, believe me. You I... had the Kimberly Cross in your inside coat pocket when you came into the wagon this morning. What are you talking about? I'll get it. The x-ray, baby. Take a look. You asked for a diagram, there it is. And you're inside left pocket. Oh, wait a minute. Hello? Mr. Spade? Yeah? This is George, the technician this, again. This is all wrong. Hold it, George. Let me see that. I don't have any inside pocket. Look, I'm wearing the suit right now. Hold it. George, what is it? Well, I got to worrying about that print of Miss Conroy's. The incipient case, 34 chest. Yeah, know? what about it? I called the lab and they checked again. It's a mistake, Mr. Spade. A switch. It belongs to someone else. Who? Johnny Stroud. Oh, Oh, well, uh, well, George, you won't have to worry about making more extra prints. What? Uh, the ones you have will do. Huh? Now, thanks. Thanks a lot, George. Uh, George is getting worried. Extra prints? Yeah, yeah, I had him run off a batch. Evidence, trial, DA's office, you know. Now, let's take her in, huh? Uh, uh, just a minute. This is crazy. I have no inside pocket. How You wouldn't I... argue with a picture, would you, honey? Give me the gun, Johnny. We'll take her in together. Uh, no, no, wait. I want to settle something else. Johnny, you're, uh, you're pointing that thing at me. It might go off. Uh, yeah, yeah, it might have that... What's eating you, Johnny? I know what's eating him. He's... Shut up. You aren't a very good liar either, are you, Sam? <laughs> there aren't any extra prints. Well, there's always George. In a couple of hours, there won't be any... George! No, you... you... Oh, you... Oh, you... <laughs> okay, Johnny, on your feet. <laughs> Let me go, Sam. Let me go. We can work out a deal. Shut up. Sam, stand your head. You're shot. Here. Here, take the gun. Call Dandy. Get it? Dandy. Homicide. And the next voice I heard belonged to cool, brisk Miss Bergamot of the Harbor Emergency Hospital. Period. And the babysitting session. How intrepid, Sam. But your wound. Nothing, sweetheart, nothing. As Hopalong Cassidy always says in Real Six, don't worry, honey, it was only a scratch. Now. Wait, now, wait. Now, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh. Can't, can't you get up without moving your lap? No, but then there's one important omission. Oh. The Kimberly Cross. Mm. What did Stroud do with it? That, Cherub, is an intramural affair between Stroud and Mr. Runcible. While, as you know, this report is an affair between you and the portable. Oh. Scoot, scoot, scoot. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery for you tomorrow evening. For music, it's your hit parade bringing you the top tunes in the land with Eileen Wilson, Snooky Lanson, and Raymond Scott's orchestra. For mystery, it's The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall as an intrepid adventurer in international intrigue who travels wherever there is mystery, danger, and romance. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, brisk, efficient Miss Perrine. You may lay it on my desk and restore your lap to its original position. Oh, yes, sir. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Comfortable, Sam? Ah, loving every minute. Sam? Yeah? A girl can't help wondering sometimes. Mm, about what? Well, the way you described the blonde in your report. Mm. Glamorous, like the Kimberly Cross and all. You like that? Oh, I just wish sometimes someone else could be your secretary. And, and I'd be the one you'd meet in a room with velvet draperies and a long cigarette holder and slanting glasses and... And a black lace negligee. Hold it, girl, hold it. You've gone quite far enough. I know, but it's only natural for a girl to want to be glamorous, eh? Yeah. Oh. Pardon me. You show up with any of those props and I'll turn you over my knee. <laughs> you like me the way I am, Sam? Yep. Mm-hmm. Why is it always this way? Mm-hmm. Just when I think I'm getting somewhere, I find myself saying, Good night, Sam. My oh, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Also in the cast were Wally Mayer, Fritz Fell, Georgia Ellis, Sidney Miller, Olin Soleil, Alice Wellman, and John Monahan. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Don't underestimate the danger of tuberculosis. Although great strides have been taken toward stamping out the disease, it still remains a menace. Last year alone, it caused 50,000 deaths in the United States. 50,000 needless deaths because TB can be controlled and cured if caught in time. The key to the complete defeat of the disease is the chest X-ray. You'll find that in many communities, chest X-rays can be obtained free of charge or at a nominal cost.